I hereby call to order this evening's departmental hearings budget for 2023. Today's date is Monday, August 29th. And seeing that we have a quorum, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Rosenberger? Volan? Here. Sims? Here. Scambaleri? Here. Sandberg? Here. Rollo? Here. Flaherty? Here. Smith? Here. And Piedmont Smith? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Quick summation of today's meeting. Um, first, we'll get an introduction and an overview from Mayor John Hamilton. Um, and we'll discuss the general financial state of the city. Then we'll get into compensation and health insurance. The departments uh, that we'll be presenting this evening will be human resources, then we'll go to clerk, then legal department, then information and technology services, then city council, then the controller, and we will discuss vehicle replacement, police pension, fire pension, and then finally this evening, the office of the mayor. And I do believe we have a motion to limit debate this evening. Uh, yes. Uh, Chair Sims, I make the following motion. I move that for the duration of budget week, we limit council member questions to no more than three minutes per council member per round of questioning, limit council member comments to three minutes per presentation, and limit public comment to two minutes per speaker. The requisites are it requires a second debatable and is amendable and requires a two-thirds vote. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Um, I will respond to council staff. Is this a clerk roll call as well? We do have a member on Zoom tonight, we so we'll have to take Zoom. votes by, by voice okay. vote tonight. Thank you. Um, will the clerk please call the roll in that motion, please? Council member Rosenberger? Yes. Volan? Yes. Sims? Yes. Scambaleri? Yes. Sandberg? Rollo? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Thank you, and that motion passes 9-0-0. Zero, zero. I would like to introduce Mayor John Hamilton for the introduction and overview to get this glorious evening started. Uh, the proposed city annual budget over the next four nights for calendar year 2023. As usual, I will begin with some shared uh, overall comments uh, to, and an outline of the entire budget, and followed then by Controller Underwood to, uh, to give some more specifics, and then Human Resources Director Shaw, uh, and then, of course, the full series of city department heads in the coming evening. So, if I may just begin a, a moment with an acknowledgement. We acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that our community is built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. We also recognize that much of the economic progress and development in our community has resulted from unpaid labor and forced servitude of people of color and specifically enslaved African labor. I wanted to make that acknowledgement as we begin our deliberations. Let me also at the outset uh, thank the staff who have worked so hard not only on this budget but on city government, in particular the cabinet members you will hear from, leaders of all of our departments, who I am very, very pleased and proud to serve with, as well as the 800 city employees. A particular thanks to those who've, whose Herculean efforts over the last few weeks, months, uh, including Controller Jeff Underwood, uh, uh, Lieutenant Cheryl Gilliland and Jeff McMillan, and all of their department, thank you for your extraordinary efforts uh, to bring us to today. So to the budget, uh, first with some essential context. Let's remember what we've been through in recent years. A once in a century global pandemic, a major recession, 
the worst U.S. presidency in history, an accelerating climate emergency, pernicious ongoing realities of racial and other discrimination, continued radical agendas from our state government on guns, public education, and now most outrageously on re reproductive rights, effectively banning abortions in Indiana as of 17 days from today. In the face of all this, since 2020, we have a powerful and welcome partner in the federal government with the CARES Act, the American Rescue Plan, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, CHIPS, and more. And locally since 2020, we have together invested through Recover Forward to protect and advance our community, all with the incredible essential public servants in the city of Bloomington. During hard times to be a public servant, I might add, as many in this room know. Amid all of these challenges and with our mutual commitments, we have made great progress, 1,100 plus units of affordable housing, significant local wage growth, unprecedented new digital equity programs and new infrastructure on the horizon, always improving outstanding parks and trails, our Hopewell and Trades District projects, essential investments in economic development, including our arts and local food sectors, and our potential convention center and showers city hall expansions. As, and as you well know as well, City of Bloomington Utilities, the Housing Authority, and Bloomington Transit continue to innovate and upgrade and be leaders in our state and region. That's collaboration and results we can be very proud of. A second last context point, this is a proposed budget that is the product of months of collaboration and listening to council members, to the public, including our three biennial city surveys with the forthcoming next year. We look forward to continuing that collaboration in the coming weeks. We began with meetings and discussions in specific and earnest in April on this budget with dozens of conversations and meetings that have since informed and shaped this budget, including, of course, the extensive debate and work on the new economic development local income tax and its designated uses. Okay, to the main event. The annual city budget is our single most important policy document. It reflects many interests, priorities, trade-offs. My job is to present a coherent and a balanced budget. I would also say a progressive budget to meet our times. State law outlines the process that we follow with lots of Bloomington additions and uh, extras. Tonight is my seventh budget presentation to this council. And no doubt this is the most significant of those seven. It is transformative. It is not an overstatement in my view to say that with this budget, we will be ushering in a new era for Bloomington. Out of the pandemic and recession and more, this transformative budget leads into a new future into this decade of the 2020s, in a way we are making Recover Forward permanent, instituting it into city plans and budgets with our focus on building climate justice, economic justice, and racial justice. Now we know also we face significant inflation and wage and hiring and retirement pressures as an employer. Like all employers, these are challenging times. And as a public employer, we note that democracy itself is under pressure. We have, I believe, a special obligation in these times as a government employer to make sure our city government is healthy and nourished up to the tasks of providing services and meeting the moment and, yes, sustaining a healthy democracy. If you believe that democracy is under serious threat, we have special obligations to make sure our local democracy embodied in our local government is vibrant and vital. 
So let me share a few general observations about how this budget meets those opportunities and challenges. Of course, I'm not going to get into the dozens of details you will hear in the coming days uh, from all of our departments. But let me start with the basic numbers. With Economic Development Local Income Tax, ED-LIT, and American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, and other revenue, our general civil city budget proposed is $129 million. That compares to $107 million for the current 2022 budget, up $22 million, or about 20% 20 from 2022 to 2023. The total budget, when you include utilities, transit, and housing authority is $229 million, comparing to $178 million for 2022, or a 29% increase. I'm going to go into what these investments mean in a moment, and Controller Underwood will add details as well. Let us note that the healthy growth of our property tax levy and general income tax revenues, and in particular the new ED-LIT adopted by this Council unanimously last spring, and continuing federal support, allows all of this. This transformative budget is best understood with three focus points. First, we strongly support city employees and all government basic services, and affirm the central role of great public services. This budget helps us be a workplace of choice for all our employees. It embodies the notion that we have an ambitious and innovative city government that is an employer of choice, delivering cost-effective modern services in ways that advance the quality of life for current and for future Bloomingtonians. Second, we embrace sustainability, in particular with transformative investments in public transit and our climate action plan. We know this makes a stronger community. It embodies the notion that Bloomington is committed to addressing the climate emergency and building a sustainable, equitable economy. And third, we embrace inclusion and justice, a city that welcomes all and works for all. This embodies the notion that Bloomington is committed to being a safe, just, and inclusive community where everyone belongs and can thrive, including with good jobs, affordable housing, and inspiring arts and public spaces. Now let me highlight in more detail some of the major changes in this transformative budget. Let's start by digging into how this budget embodies being an employer of choice and strengthening all of our basic services. The 2023 budget makes unprecedented investments in all of our people, strengthening all of our basic services. Supported by the ED-LIT and federal resources, this budget proposes First, a 5% cost of living adjustment for all non-union employees. Unions receive their own contracted amounts. Second, reflecting the special challenges of this period, from inflation to pandemic to public services generally, the, the uh, budget includes a $1,000 bonus to be paid quarterly to public uh, service employees um, to all employees, I'm sorry, a $1,000 bonus to pay to all employees with the exception of sworn BPD officers and dispatch staff who recently had their own significant adjustments. Third, this budget proposes a new deferred compensation matching program available to all employees, union or non, up to $780 per year, matching either two to one or three to one employee voluntary retirement contributions. That's a new program to support our employees. Fourth, this budget proposes establishing a primary care health clinic for employees and families by the end of the year. It also expands, uh, as we just announced last week, housing assistance to our first responders to include firefighters with police 
including an $18,000 down payment for a house or $750 a month rent for those living in the city. Human Resources Director Shaw will share more details shortly, including health care benefits, parental leave, and tuition reimbursement pilots, salary studies, and more. The budget proposes 17 and a half net new positions in the civil city, with another 13 and a half new positions planned by Utilities, Transit, and Housing Authority. Most of those are paid for by ED Lit and other sources besides the general fund. Public safety receives particular focus. We have outstanding public safety services. We continue to be the only city in Indiana with a top rated certified fire department, ISO 1, and a nationally accredited police department, the only one, with lowering crime rates and with zero fire fatalities and 10 confirmed saves in the last six years. Both of these departments continue to evolve and innovate and lead progressive change. You'll hear more about that, I know, tomorrow evening. For now, note that the budget funds nine new public safety positions, including a social worker to operate directly with 911 dispatch, two fire health interventionists at the fire department, three additional community care specialists at police, a full-time dedicated public safety recruiter position, and a new position at CFRD, Community and Family Resources, as well. In addition, the 2023 budget funds housing, these housing incentives I mentioned. There are seven police using the rental uh, subsidies now. Uh, and of course, it supports very much needed new facilities for both police and fire. Other basic services investments are protected and strengthened by ARPA. Our national accreditation continues. You may recall six years ago we had only parks as a nationally accredited department. Today we have added police and fire. Uh, and next year we expect to add public works as a nationally accredited department. Of course, housing authority and utilities and transit themselves all have related federal oversight and uh, not exactly accreditation, but similar. I will also urge you to look at the recently released city annual goals update for 2022, just released last week, 564 specific goals of our department and the outcomes thus far in 2022. Of course, you can look back to 2021. I'm not gonna go through all the excellence of our, uh, of our departments from the double gold medal of parks to the sanitation reform of affordable housing we mentioned and all the work of planning and ESD and others. Um, I'll just note, uh, I'm really proud of the basic services that we provide. As to sustainability, this budget is indeed transformative. We begin in 2023 an annual more than $1.6 million appropriation directly to fund our Climate Action Plan implementation. You will see details of that range of investments with the Economic Sustainability Department. And of course, transit is entering a new era. This budget reflects a planned memorandum of understanding to invest just under $4 million in local dollars to expand public transit services. BT's annual budget leverages that local funding to grow from $15 million this year to $35 million next year. They already were awarded a new $7 million federal grant uh, to buy eight new electric buses uh, in no small part because of the support from the local money. And I just, I just want to compare this very, very significant level of local support for climate with the federal. So stay with me just a moment. But we just learned recently of the new federal $375 billion investment in climate that was part of the Inflation Reduction Act, an unprecedented level of federal investment for climate, direct climate work. Now, I, I know these aren't exactly apples to apples, but that was the big new federal program. That works out to $1,100 per capita in the United States over the next 10 years, roughly. That huge climate investment. Our local investment of $55 million, five and a half million a year for the next 10 years, is the equivalent of about $650 per capita locally. 
So just chew on that, that we're, we're locally doing two-thirds the level of the national press, unprecedented climate investment. So it's a really significant step for us. I'm really proud we're doing it locally, and I wanted just to share that comparison. As to inclusion and justice, this budget also sets a new high bar. With ED Lit support, we are investing $1 million directly in affordable housing. That adds to the $5 million in one-time ARPA money this year and last that we've set aside already, and another million dollars in the Economic Equity Fund to support low-income working families facing struggles. We look forward to working with you on details of this and other programs now and in the future, including more than $300,000 in funding for job readiness and local food and arts programs to continue the critical momentum of Recover Forward. We also continue the work of the Racial Equity Plan, the Future Policing Task Force, and the DEI collaboration with IU and other partners. So with this transformative budget, we are doing many new things, very importantly, and expanding future-oriented efforts. We also cannot keep doing everything that we do today. We have to set priorities and pivot away from things also that let us save money and address future priorities better. One way we do that is by doing more work without more staff and resources. For example, this budget does not expand the number of hand apartment inspectors, even though each inspector is today responsible for 27% more apartment inspections than they were in 2010. They're getting more and more efficient. Our eight fleet mechanics today are each responsible for 42% more vehicles now compared to 2004 when we also had eight mechanics. We are proposing to add one mechanic in this budget, which would mean each fleet mechanic is then responsible for only 27% more vehicles than they were in 2004. There are other more direct changes we're proposing in this budget, making some hard choices, and I hope you'll agree. We look forward to working on them with you. One, we plan to continue to reform sanitation, putting it on a three-year path to zero general fund subsidy. This continues our major reforms of 2017 and depends on working with you, council, taking action and adjustment to cart fees. Two, we're planning changes to our leafing program. With continued regular lawn waste pickup and intensive support for mulching and composting, we are proposing a termination of the free curbside vacuum services for 2023. Three, we're planning to seek to transfer street, street sweeping responsibilities to utilities, focusing on their stormwater management responsibilities, which can increase the level of street sweeping substantially and may be accomplished with a one or two year subsidy to help support that transfer. Fourth, we plan to develop a reduction or elimination of coin services from our parking meters. This will save money, allow more flexibility in our banking relationships, and also be accompanied, we will accompany it with improvements in the meter protocols to give customers better experiences and options. Fifth, we plan to convert a parcel of city-owned property, likely a surface parking lot, into affordable housing next year. We look forward to working together determine, to determine which one and how, but we think that's a good step. And finally, in this list anyway, we plan to convene a review of our 911 protocols and deployments to maximize efficiency and reflect our community values to, to review how best to deploy our sworn public safety resources and identify best practices nationally. These adjustments will let us reassign existing employees from some of these activities to more 
sidewalk improvements and clearing and installation of ADA ramps and better paving, e expanding Brighton B Town, perhaps snow clearing as well. So to summarize the budget, size at 129 million, up 20%, including the three outside entities, uh, up to 229 million. Positions, 17 and a half net new civil city jobs, plus 13 and a half you'll hear from our three affiliated entities. That's about a 3% growth of employment. These major new investments, unprecedented and transformative, are supported primarily by ED Lit at $16 million and ARPA at $5 million. Finally, after a review of those key components, let me conclude briefly with just some quick updates. As to ARPA and Recover Forward, to date, you'll recall in 2021, we dedicated 3.4 million for housing, nearly a million uh, in ESD, and 700,000 in lead abatement. In 2022, current year, we have dedicated about $10 million of ARPA for housing, 3.6, for economic sustainable development, 1.6. For revenue replacement, 3.2 million, mostly to police and fire, parks, and streets. Infrastructure, about a million dollars this year going to information technology and engineering, and half a million dollars for COVID relief payments. Proposing for 2023 is about $4.9 million in ARPA revenue, uh, revenue replacement, uh, going to, to capital for parks and engineering. Again, parks and engineering at a, n almost $3 million. And to streets for operations, street sweeping, traffic management enhancement. About $400,000 for project management of major projects ahead. Another $330,000 for economic sustainable development. And, and smaller amounts for tuition reimbursement pilots and others. We shared a memo as well with you last week on five other topics of updates. I'm just gonna itemize it, happy to take questions about the two five-year bond projects which are underway. We gave you an update on where those stand, including two projects we're able to fund outside the bonds, the Griffey Lake uh, Dam Crossing and 25,000 for battery equipment at parks. It also updated the Hopewell Project, the potential showers building purchase and updated our regulation and management of electric scooters locally, as well as some potential new composting efforts. As you know, we're working as well to activate and advance the potential expansion of our downtown convention center, which could be a substantial effort yet this year and in 2023 and beyond. The two issues that are not items in our city budget, I just wanna mention because I believe they are major challenges in our community's wider budget one is the challenge of criminal justice reform, and the second is our public health system, in particular, our mental health system and support for people experiencing substance use disorder. These are all related. This is not the time or place for details here tonight, but I just will emphasize the importance of major upcoming investments in these areas, I believe, as part of transforming our community's future. So having presented the budget summary, I'll note our public input will continue ongoing with you, with the public, commissions, et cetera. We are fortunate to live in a great city of Bloomington, Indiana. I am pleased to present to you a transformative 2023 budget that makes that future even brighter, more sustainable, more just, more inclusive, with a city government staffed by some of the finest public servants anywhere. Thank you very much. I look forward to working together with you, and uh, I'll hand it over to Controller Jeff Underwood, who I believe is going to visit with us remotely. Unless you want to do questions now. I don't know how you want to handle that. Thank you, Mayor. Just hang out there just for a second. Um, per to, pursuant to our motion to limit debate, I just want to remind everyone that there will be an opportunity for council questions that will be limited to three minutes per council member. Um, there will be an opportunity for public comment that will be limited to two minutes per um, individual. And then there will be an opportunity for council comment, which again will be three minutes per council member. 
um, at the end of each department's budget presentation, uh, we will entertain a due pass recommendation for that department's budget. Now, if we can entertain it, do we have any questions for the mayor from council members? Council Member Rallo. Thank you, Chair Sims. Thank you, uh, Mayor Hamilton, for your introduction. Um, one very uh, prominent concern that I have is related to wage erosion for city employees. Wage erosion due to inflation. Um, and observing that in 2021, nationally, we experienced about 7% inflation this year, about 85 and anticipating in 2023, I was just reading the Dallas Fed, anticipates at 7.7% uh, inflation. So my question is, should we not be keeping wages in pace with CPI? We have, you've proposed the 5% increase for employees, um, and those are non-union. Um, you're going to negotiate with the AFSCME union as well. It's come to my attention that we have a retention problems related to uh, our failure to keep pace with, with inflation. Their employees are leaving to the private sector. Uh, and with that goes experience. Uh, people who have interacted with the public who, who, who know the city well. Um, so I would be, I'm surprised that we are adding employees at a time when we should be increasing wages for those employees that, that need to keep pace because their wages are eroding. So could you help explain why we are not focusing on that, on keep, at least keeping uh, employees wages in pace with inflation? Thank you. I'd be happy to um, make brief comments about that, and then I know you'll hear more from um, the Human Resource Director Shaw as well. Uh, I'm, I agree that uh, like any employer today, we're facing pressures. Um, I think virtually every employer is facing pressures of uh, hiring folks, retaining folks. I'm very proud of this budget that we presented to you as I think a very aggressive and progressive uh, an ambitious effort to make ourselves an employer of choice. I outlined four major things that we're doing. Uh, um, Human Resource Director Shaw will, will indicate some more, but uh, I think it's a balance between a pure percent COLA, cost of living adjustment, and a more progressive fixed dollar amount, which will support lower income wage earners at a relatively higher percentage amount. Uh, if you combine that those two things with um, the matching savings plan for retirement, which we think is really important, not something we've never done before, uh, as well as increases in health subsidy for those who do get health care. An example of a uh, $40,000 city employee would see about an 11% increase in their, in their compensation. I think that's really good. Nothing we've ever done like that before. Um, there are other things to be done. We're looking at tuition reimbursement, housing assistance. We've talked about some of those things. Um, I think uh, we welcome input on that, but I do think this is an extraordinarily um, ambitious effort to support our essential employees uh, in helping them continue the work they do. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from council members? Okay, thank you, Mayor Hamilton. Um, as a matter of correction, I will add that um, the mayor's overview and general financial state of the city, and the compensation and health insurance will not be subject to public comment. I'm saying public comments. Um, they will be allowed during each departmental presentation at the end of that. So I just want to correct that and make sure that we're done. Okay, we're ready for Mr. Underwood and general financial state of the city. Good evening. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Good. Jeff Underwood, city controller, uh, presenting, I think, or being involved in now my 23rd city budget over uh, two terms of duty. I don't think I'm close to breaking a mixed record, and, and I certainly don't intend to. 
Uh, thank you for uh, hearing us tonight and for allowing us to present this budget to you. I'd like uh, my staff, especially Jeff McMillan and Cheryl Gilliland, uh, for all their hard work and, and uh, me constantly knocking on their doors saying, are we done yet? Are we done yet? Uh, to our staff, to department heads, to uh, the mayor, deputy mayor, and all the uh, mayor that helps us. I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Apologies for the interruption. No problem. Is Thank that you. Better? Um, I believe let's, so. Let's, let's try. Go ahead. Right. Okay. I'll try and talk uh, louder as well. Um, just wanted to thank my staff and all the folks that helped us out. Uh, this is a large undertaking that the, takes the most time of anything that uh, we do in the city. Uh, I'm very proud of what we're able to present tonight. As the mayor said, uh, we're presenting a $129.2 million budget, uh, not inclusive of utilities or transit. This covers 36 funds and 26 department and divisions. Uh, this represents an increase of over $22 million. Uh, major increases to this were uh, the local income tax economic development of $16 million. Uh, you'll see an appropriation request in the food and beverage fund of $4 million and the housing development fund of $2 million. Moving on to uh, our revenue streams, and I'm talking uh, complete over the whole uh, $129 million. Um, and we'll catch up here with the slides. So one more. Uh, property taxes uh, represent 33.6% of the total revenues of this $129 million budget. Uh, this uh, will be a 5% increase in the levy, uh, which is the highest increase in the last 20 years. The closest one to the 5% increase was 4.8 in 2003. So uh, we're very thankful for that. Uh, local income tax represents a total of 31.7%. There are three different uh, buckets of local income tax. There are certified shares, uh, and those go to the general fund. That represents 12.1%. Economic development represents 13.5%. And public safety, uh, which funds uh, our central dispatch as well as capital for our police and fire, uh, is 6.1% of that total. Finally, we have miscellaneous revenues that represent 34.8% of the total revenues of the city. These are things as fees for services, permits, sanitation, parking fees, and parking permits, uh, fines, interest income, uh, federal and state highway funds, uh, as well as matching uh, funds, excise and gasoline taxes, uh, interlocal agreements, uh, such as with the county, Indiana University and utilities, police and fire pension reimbursements, and as I said, 34.8%. Um, our ARPA cares and um, money uh, is included in these miscellaneous revenues. Moving to the next page, um, in listening to some of the uh, requests by the city council, uh, we tried to make improvements to both my presentation and the uh, departmental ones. And I know this uh, is, is a little hard to see, but I know you all have, uh, other than uh, Councilmember Volan, uh, have uh, tablet size uh, printouts of this particular document. This uh, is the 36 funds that I talked about and the 26, um, 26 departments and divisions. And you can see now where every fund that a department is budgeted out of in total. So as you go uh, across, you'll see the funds uh, and also see which department those have been allocated to for the entire $129.2 million. You'll also see a summary like this uh, within each uh, presentation that uh, will break down this information in further detail. Moving along to the next, uh, just a couple of things here is uh, showing this is the uh, breakdown for the entire budget uh, by category. And thanks to Andrew for helping uh, uh, reformat this for us. Uh, as you can see, debt service represents about 2% of the total budget. 
uh, capital is 9%. Uh, the property tax caps, uh, 1%. Um, personnel, 47%. Supply, 6%. And service is 35%. And I did skip over my note to say that uh, our property tax caps increased uh, a little over $250,000 this year. Uh, this is uh, pretty close. The 2023 amount is pretty close to the 2020, 2021 amount, and we continue to be a low uh, tax cap uh, community. So that's good news. Going on to the next uh, slide, and this is the breakdown by function. Again, you see debt service at 2%, tax caps at 1%. Services, these are outside facing services account for 43%. Administrative, these are the internal, so controllers, office, legal, HR, uh, 8%. Capital, uh, 9%. Uh, parks and recreation, 8%. And public uh, service at the largest uh, beyond services at 29%. Finally, uh, we always talk about uh, our reserves, especially in our general fund. I'm happy to report that at the end of 2021, we uh, ended at 38.3%. Our goal and target is 33%. So we had approximately four and a half months of the city's general fund expenditures uh, on online. And we're projecting to end this year at around 40% and 2023 at 39%. Uh, and that's uh, just projected amounts and that'll be subject uh, to actual uh, revenue and expenditures. Uh, that is uh, the general recap of the budgets. Obviously, over the next four nights, you'll get additional details uh, by each department and the funds that they um, get funded out of. And at this point, uh, I want to say that there are additional exhibits uh, in the memo that was sent to the council office as well as online. Those are a little hard to see uh, on presenting this way, so I'm not going to go through those. But uh, it's information on historic levy growth, historic cash balances, um, our reserves, and then as well as um, the 10 year police and fire uh, public safety lit uh, plans and the one year capital plan um, for the, that's included with uh, this year. With that, I am happy to answer uh, questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Underwood. Um, do we have any questions from council at this time? Specific councils for Mr. Underwood. Council member Pete Mott Smith. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Underwood. I know you and your staff have worked incredibly hard as always on the budget. Um, I, uh, and you probably know the, the council didn't get the, the overview documents until just this afternoon. Um, is it listed somewhere in here or could you provide um, any expenditures over uh, $100,000 for capital um, expenditures? Is that listed somewhere? Uh, yes, in the memo that was sent out to you this afternoon, it's the uh, last document. It has all the capital by fund and uh, described as well. Okay, so the I see the fire department capital plan Police department should be the very last. Should be the very last document in the. Uh, oh, I memo. see it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have any further questions of Mr. Underwood from Council? Council Member Rallo. Thank you, Mr. Underwood, um, for your presentation. Um, what is the uh, cost of the five percent increase uh, in wages uh, for? City I'll, I'll break it down. In, okay, I'll break it down for you a couple of ways. In the general fund, which is the the primary, it's around seven hundred and ten thousand dollars. And for all of the funds, it's approximately nine hundred and fifty-two thousand. And in addition to that, uh, the sergeants in the police department uh, get the um, union increase, even though they're non-union. That's another one hundred and thirty-one thousand dollars. I see. So. Total of that is uh, one point oh eight million dollars. One point oh eight million. Thank you. Uh, one, one other quick question: um, Have we? I, I, there's nothing preventing us from making, say, tiered wage increases. 
for employees making under a certain amount. Clearly, we've done that in the past. We brought certain employees up to a living wage. So could we deploy that, say, for employees making under 60K per year, just as a thought experiment? I would have to double check the way that our budgets work. We're grouped into employee groups. So you have AFSCME, you have police mm -hmm. union, union, and then um, non-union employees. And the way the software works, you have to apply a flat percentage across that group. So we would either have to go in and try and break them up or apply it individually. Uh, and that would, that would be pretty arduous to do so. Okay, I see. So it, it might be possible, but it does sound complicated. Uh, well, we can discuss it later. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any further questions from council? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Under I'm sorry, Council Member Volan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Um, quick question, Mr. Underwood. Um, the uh, the new lit represents a substantial increase in the percentage of our budget that comes from uh, local income tax. Can you give us a rough idea of what the percentage uh, of previous budgets was? In other, in other words. Uh, we're roughly a third uh, property tax, a little less than a third lit, and a little more than a third in uh, other revenues. How would a previous budget have broken down roughly? I believe, I'll have to double check and don't hold me to this, scope, but I'll do some quick math for you. Um, yeah. It would have been, uh, I know in the general fund alone, uh, property taxes were over 50% of the general fund budget and um, cer the uh, certified shares were another, um, I think it was 55, 25, it was about 80% was property taxes and lit. Obviously uh, you're looking at um, the certified shares is gonna be about $14.3 million. Um, and million dollars in economic development lit so you can see that that number more than doubled so it would have a fairly significant uh, breakdown but I, i'll do some math and, and get that that question it sounds like it was roughly uh you know it was 55 25 before and now it's more like uh 34 31. yeah and that was on the total so i'll uh, i can I, I can look at last year and break get an overall breakdown for you then translate that to this year's. I, I think it would be helpful to underscore the significance of the lit um, to, to be able to boil it down to that simple a number and it would be uh, some kind of a chart like that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no more questions. Thank you. Seeing no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Underwood. We'll now Thank move. Thank you all. We'll now move through compensation and health insurance um, overview. And I do believe Ms. Shaw is here for that this evening. Good evening. Good evening, council members. It's nice to be with you all in person this evening for a change. My name is Caroline Shaw. I'm the human resources director here at the city. The compensation and benefits presentation is the first of two presentations for me this evening. I have the technology worked out virtually, but not here. I apologize for that. Here are a few of our accomplishments related to compensation and benefits over the years. We completed salary surveys in 2017 and 2018, which influenced employee pay. The department helped impl implement a mayoral initiative supported by youth city council members to increase the minimum hourly rate to $15 per hour for all of our city's regular full-time and part-time employees. The current minimum rate is $16.26 per hour. In addition, with the support of the city council, pay rates for temporary employees are adjusted each year to ensure that all city temporary employees receive at least the living wage. To, employ, to promote employee safety, HR implemented and continues to manage a COVID-19 vaccine incentive program, which gives employees up to $200 
and vaccination incentives and an annual $600 discount on insurance premiums. At the time we drafted our budget memo, 74% of our current employees have received at least the initial dose or doses of the COVID vaccine. Our budget reflects significant increases to employee compensation and benefits, along with new programs that will benefit employees. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Our budget uh, reflects significant increases to employee compensation and benefits. Along with new programs that will benefit employees, these changes support our desire to become an employer of choice. Specifically, our budget includes the following increases to base pay a 5% increase for non-union and elected officials, contractual increases for police, 13.17% for officers first class and then 12.67% for senior police officers in 2023, and contractual increases for fire at 2%. Common law, temporary employees will receive no less than the living wage at 15.29 per hour. And most employees with the exception of sworn officers will receive $250 at the end of each quarter in 2023, totaling $1,000 by the end of that year. Twenty twenty three compensation highlights include increasing premium subsidies for most medical tiers. This means that many employees will pay less for insurance in twenty twenty three than they are currently paying. And with the COVID six hundred dollar nine COVID nineteen six hundred dollar vaccine discount, employees with a high deductible plan only will pay pay nothing next year, which is which is pretty amazing. Employees on any tier of the high deductible health plan will receive at $850 in city contributions to their health savings account, which is a big increase over what contributed in the past. And employees, as the mayor mentioned, employees with a 457B will receive matching funds up to $780 annually. The 341 match at, 15, at $5 and 241 match at $10 and $15 respectively, but up to $30 per pay period. We will also be implementing a pilot paid parental leave program later this fall in the fourth quarter. This will continue into next year with the hopes of having a family paid family leave in 2024. A pilot tuition reimbursement program will also be introduced in 2023. Other by, uh, compensation highlights include in category one personnel, FICA remains at 7.65% and the Public Employees Retirement Fund uh, contribution for non-public safety employees is still 14.2%, but there was a half a percent increase for sworn public safety for next year, which brings it up from 21.5% to 22%. The perfect counts include an employer contribution and an employee contribution. The city pays the employees portion, which is 3% for non-public safety, and four of the 6% for all public safety. The City of Bloomington has been a member of the AIM Medical Trust, formerly IAC, since January 1st of 2011. And since its inception, 20, since its inception in 22, 2010, rather, the Medical Trust has grown from four member cities and towns to 51 member cities and towns. The City continues to have a leadership role by serving on the Medical Trust Board of Trustees and on the Underwriting Committee. We continue to budget $14,274 for all employee insurance and benefits. Our, parti Oops. Our partici participation in the AIM Medical Trust has saved the city an average of approximately $4 million a year and provided consistent stability. Our average annual renewal has been about 5.3% compared to the current medical trend, which is typically around 8.5%. Dental and vision insurance. The dental plan remains a self-funded and administered, and administered through a third-party administrator and network. We have not received notification of any rate changes or plan changes, but historically, changes, if any, from year to year have been very minor. These next two slides list several of our other benefits that we offer our benefit-eligible employees. As you can see, this mentions a health savings account. We are increasing all contributions to the health saving ac account for all employees by $850. I will highlight other benefits on this slide. As you know, we introduced a pilot parking cash out program for City Hall employer, employees early this year, earlier this year, 
Next year, we will offer a $500 stipend for those who are eligible and choose not to drive to City Hall. We will continue to offer a $600 annual insurance premium discount for those who have received their initial vaccination against COVID-19. And we additionally offer $100 for an employee's initial vaccination and another $100 if they have received a booster. The city will also provide reimbursement of up to $2,500 for travel and lodging expenses for employees who go out of state to get an abortion. We're also planned to open an employee health clinic by the fourth quarter of 2023. I'm also very excited about that. This is a compensation benefit statement. An employee with a $40,000 salary this year will get a 5% increase along with four $250 payments over, over the year, totaling $1,000 by the end of 2023 including the, the contribution to public employee retirement fund, about $600, deferred compensation match of $780, paid time off valued at around $6,000, and the FICA tax at about $3,000. The total compensation of a $40,000 employee is valued at over $73,500 in 2023. For this employee, the $2,000 cost of living increase, $1,000 in extra pay, the additional $850 in the health savings account contribution along with the available $708 in deferred matching contribution comes up to a little over 11% of their current salary. Thank you for your consideration of these. This concludes the first of my two presentations this evening, and I thank you for your consideration of the 2023 Compensation and Benefits Budget Request. I'm happy to answer any questions now or at the conclusion of my next presentation, whichever you prefer. Thank you, Ms. Shaw, for your presentation, and I'll let my colleagues decide how they want to ask questions. So, Council Member Rallo. Thank you, Ms. Shaw. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to get some data related to attrition. Uh, as I mentioned before in my question to Mayor Hamilton, uh, my concern is that we're losing uh, employees and, and uh, their experience and so forth to, uh, to the private sector or maybe to other municipalities, I don't know. Um, so, do we have data related to total departures over the past year, and do we also give exit surveys so that we understand the reasons by which they're leaving? Yes, we do. Okay, could you could could the, can you send that to the council? Could yes, I'd be happy to. That? I have I have it here, like we presented during the ED lid hearings, and I will say the trends are that we presented during that time are very consistent: police, fire, trans transmission and distribution, and utilities are the biggest issues. But I'll share, I'll share the graphic rep representation. So, so certain departments are affected more than others? Yes. And um, do we also, uh, do we have employee satisfaction surveys that we uh, give to city employees? We, we issue, upon departure, we offer an employee exit survey. Uh, and we have not, currently have an employee satisfaction survey. We don't. Um, hmm. Uh, to your knowledge, when was the last time that we, we gave a survey to employees in terms of their satisfaction and what they feel you know, they're lacking or what they feel is, are benefits to them, so forth? We, during the COVID pandemic, we did some things called pulse surveys to kind of get a pulse on how employees were feeling, but we have not issued a formal satisfaction survey. Okay. We, we do try to facilitate those kinds of conversations within the departments and talk to employees about that and how and take their feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how would you gauge morale then in the city if you don't have such surveys? I mean, do you rely on uh, people coming to you or, or, or de department heads uh, to, to understand maybe challenges for their employees? Is that, is that, generally speaking, how uh, you would gauge morale in the city? Conversations are the best way for us to gauge morale. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Scambolari. Yes, thank you. Uh, could you put the slide up again on the, comp with the, it was second to the last, I think, the compensation and benefit statement? Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Um, Ms. Shaw, I get something like this from IU every year, and it, it lays out everything. Is this for our benefit, or does every employee get their own customized statement like this? We have not issued a customized statement like this in a few years, but we do plan to. We've been talking about it. As you know, we have a very small staff, but I think this sure. is an important thing for our employees to see because there's a lot more to your compensation than just space compensation. Well, and I, I think to Councilmember Rollo's question, I, 
I think it would be a source, of, a point of departure for discussing what kind of benefits are most of greatest interest to our employees Absolutely. and which ones aren't. Um, what would it take to do that? Is that a, is, has that been budgeted? Is, have, have we run the numbers on that? I would have to look into that a little bit. Um, okay, I would be interested and in I would be happy more about to do that. that. Um, again, I appreciate Councilmember Rallo's questions on data on recruitment and retention. Um, what kind of participation, separate question, what kind of participation are you seeing in the parking cash out program? I have that data right here. So uh, for this initial pilot program, which we induced, introduced kind of midway through this year, uh, there were approximately 181 employees who were eligible for the cash out. 17 employees applied for the program and received the $250 incentive. That's about 9% of those who were eligible to participate. And I'll just also give you an update. You all had asked the question of how many of our city hall employees um, live within the city limits. And uh, that number is actually more for like 40%. And that's my update. But we will roll out the program and again the beginning of next year. And it'll be $500. It'll be interesting to watch the numbers then. Yes, so. it will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you, Ms. Shaw. I am also interested in this question of um, where our money is best spent, whether it be on retaining our experienced, uh, knowledgeable employees or on um, recruiting new employees. Um, and in that vein, I wonder how many vacancies do we currently have that has lasted more than three months? I'll have to get that data for you. And then um, also I'd be interested in what has been the rate of voluntary resignations in the last two years, so July 2020 through June 22, compared to the two years before that. Um, to better understand, uh, because you know, hearsay will tell us it's, it's increased but I'd like to see the data on that uh, because I, I'm also concerned about um, uh, making sure we uh, keep, to, keep up with inflation and keep those experienced employees. So if you could get that, that'd be great. Um, I have one other question about parking cash out. Um, has that amount been set and decided upon, the $500 for next year? Because initially we had, uh, some council members had discussed that it should be the market value of the parking, which would be quite a bit more than $500. I've, if Controller Underwood is still with us, I may defer that question to him, if that's appropriate. Usually he's standing here beside me. Uh, I was out of the office. There he is. I, he's I believe. Not here <laughs> <laughs> yes, there he left is. The uh, this, yeah, we discussed this uh, during um, our council budget retreat, and we had talked initially about a low, much lower amount. And then as we did an analysis on the dollar amounts that we charge for various permits and fees, uh, we settled on $500, which was uh, midpoint between uh, an employee all permit parking uh, for downtown businesses that ran a hundred and some dollars to um, reserved uh, 24 hours seven in the garages, which I believe was seven, 700 and some dollars. So uh, based on the analysis I did that it cost us about $100 uh, a year for to maintain that parking lot, I had doubled that to 200 and then after discussion with the council, we agreed to all raise that to $500 as a part of the uh, a pilot. So we'll, we'll analyze that again um, for a full year and, and see what impact that has. And uh, if we need to make adjustments, uh, we'll certainly talk to the council about that and the administration and make another recommendation for uh, 2024. Thank you, Mr. Underwood. Could, could you share that math with us, like how the 500 was arrived at? I mean, not right yeah, now, I'll, but. Uh, I don't have my notes with me, but yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Flaherty. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Shaw and everyone. I had a follow-up actually on that question. Um, does the number of permits sold to city employees uh, ever exceed the amount of spaces available in the, the lot here? That's another question I'll have to circle back with parking okay. services on. We're happy to do that though. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, before we move on, I'm, I'm sorry, Council Member Volan. Sorry about that. Thanks, Mr. That's all right. I, I know I'm remote tonight. I apologize, everyone. I tested positive for COVID still. Um, Mr. Underwood, uh, 
is it possible as a result of the uh, the arbitrary increase you made to five hundred dollars that some employees are now getting more than the market value of the permit that they are cashing out? In other words, if you said it, that that was a sort of an average between some people who are getting 20, 20 have to buy twenty four seven permits and some people who are getting a less expensive permit in some lot somewhere. Um, I, are they able to, are, is, are they cashing out up to $500 or is it $500 across the board? It, it's $500, it, was, it will be $500 across the board for next year, it was 250 this year. Um, what I did was I did, I, I had uh, parking services provide me with all of the various permits that we sell, so I analyzed those in addition to the analysis that I did on the cost of the lot. Uh, there's uh, several permits. There's an all zone permit uh, that you can be purchased uh, from the, for um, parking areas. I believe it's like $125. There is an all zone permit for employees working downtown that I believe was in the $125, $150 range uh, up to the 24 reserves, <coughs> seven, I believe it was it was between seven and eight hundred dollars. So essentially, when we looked at talked with the council, was my recommend, initial recommendation was two hundred dollars. Was um, you all did not believe that was enough to incentivize folks to uh, switch? So we moved that up to uh, five hundred dollars. Um, now that's not to say that you can so say someone's working. Uh, is working remotely uh, two days out of, of three and, and took the, the, the cash out. They could park in the garages and they may net out still. Uh, so the two days that they drive into the office, they, they can park on the street or park in one of the garages with hourly parking. Uh, so I haven't done the analysis on, on, on that to say, yeah, so I'll do the $500 uh, cash out, but I'll, I'll just pay to park in covered parking. The, two days a week or three days a week that I'm in the office uh, and, uh, and it'll, it'll even out or it'll net out. Okay, but I mean, the so I'm still concerned about the case of an employee who is normally paying $150 or $200 for a permit and they apply for parking cash out. They're not cashing out the permit, they're simply getting a $500 benefit. Um, why? Why would, uh, I mean, why is it not up to $500 if you're making every, I mean, the idea is you, you're literally cashing out the permit that you would have bought. Well, again, employees had two choices uh, before. They either not get a city permit or they got a city permit and it was $2. That was the permits that they could get. Uh, the new program said you can either um, get a permit for zero or you can get a cash out for $250. When we, when I talked about the 500 and the 250, the 250 was prorated for half a year, was I looked at right. all the types of permits that the city sells. So looking at the range that's available across the city. Now, that's not to say that it's city employees. Now, they could live in a parking zone area and they could buy an all zone permit. I, we don't, I didn't get it down into that depth of the analysis. I essentially looked at all of the different permits that were sold by parking services for park, various parking activities um, and said, and, and said I, I think striking a happy medium of $500 uh, was, was um, reasonable in looking at that. And again, it's a pilot, so uh, we're trying to see does it change um, habits. It could well be that it's too much. It could well be that it's not enough to uh, change people's as, as um, uh, Caroline Shaw, Ms. Shaw said 40% or less people live in the city, so uh, there's not much of an incentive for people that live outside the county or live in the county or outside the county um, not to go ahead and take the permit. Okay, uh, I'm this, this is disappointing uh, to learn, but I, I appreciate the explanation um, and I'll have more to say later. I'd like to ask Ms. Shaw a question about paid time off. Is she there? I can't see. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm right here. Okay. Um, so the the slide that Councilmember Scambelluri asked you to put up 
noted that there, if you could, somebody could put that up again, uh, that there's 304 hours a year of paid time off. Is that, a, is that a year or is that like just, you know, a pool that builds up for employees? 304, 304 hours annually for an employee who's been with the city less than five years. If you've been with the city longer, you earn even more than that. And I'm happy to share that those tables with you. If you it, does, does that represent a, a change or an increase? It's the same as it's, it's always been uh, since I've been here. And, and when we've done, uh, and you're, when we did the first benefit and compensation study several years ago, that was very much in line with other public agencies. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Flaherty, um, and I will remind our staff that we're allowed three minutes. I don't think we're keeping a running total. So I just want you to keep that in mind. So, thank you. Actually, in follow-up in writing, thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions from council members? Uh, Ms. Shaw, I, I don't know if I have a question or a comment. And as you know, we do have a mechanism that the council members will be able to submit questions to department heads after all this and get responses. Um, but one of the things that uh, interests me and intrigues me is the concept of a comprehensive employee exit survey. And what is the strategy and how do we implement that? Um, and, and what are the results that we're getting from that? Um, uh, not so much tonight, but I think it's important that when we're talking about retention um, and hiring that we know why we're losing folks. We hear a lot about salaries. Um, and, but there's other possible reasons, so I'd like to hear more about that. I, we do it, look at that data in aggregate, and we're happy to report on that. Thank you. Okay, do we have any more questions? Thank you, Ms. Shaw. Well, and you might as well hang around because you're up I'm next hanging for around the human resources. Now, I will remind our staffs in the public that now that we're getting into department um, presentations, we will have the council questions, then public comments, and then council final comments before we go to a due pass recommendation. So thank you, and please proceed. Thank you, and I'll try to get this clicker right this time. So before I begin with the presentation of the Human Resources Department budget, I'd like to give a special thank you to the small but mighty HR staff that helps us get all of our work done. We have a good group that we work very closely with. By util utilizing innovative best practices in human resources management, the Human Resources Department exists to create a positive, productive, and inclusive work environment that attracts, retains, and develops talent in order to accomplish organizational goals. Just to give you a little bit of background, we currently have six regular employees, a temporary employee, and one vacancy. Half of our current staff is certified by the Society in Human Resources Management, which is the recognized authority on HR management. HR continues to play a significant role in keeping our employees safe from COVID. We have coordinated implicit bias and anti-racism training. Most regular employees have participated in implicit bias training and city leaders and department heads, as you know, and other elected officials have been participating in anti-racism training since last fall. We work to standardize our hiring practices to promote fairness and equity. We've implemented an internship program that sets standards for internship opportunities and hiring. In addition to the implicit bias and anti-racism training that we've coordinated, we've also assigned other online courses to train and support our staff. Here's a brief summary of our goals for this current year. Our first staffing goal is to implement and maintain strategies to increase the diversity and total number of qualified applicants for position vacancies. And one of the strategies that we've implemented this year is to review interview questions and provide feedback to hiring managers prior to them interviewing candidates. Our second goal is related to staffing is to contract an organizational assessment for the Parks and Recreation Department. This will commence later this fall. And training is the focus of our compliance activities so that staff remain in compliance with city standards, policies, and other laws. As I mentioned, HR has participated in coordinating anti-racism training for department heads and elected officials, including city council members. We've also required online training for city staff, and I, I'm currently, I participate in the contract negotiations between the city and the Fraternal Order of Police, which was finalized earlier this year, and I'm currently participating on a team that's negotiating a contract for AFSCME.
HR has developed an employee incentive program, and we will continue to refine that plan for consideration later this year. HR has also done preliminary research in purchasing a wellness platform that will help us remove towards an outcome-based wellness program. I'm working to partner, I'm working with AIM to identify an employee health clinic partner that we will hopefully activate by the end of next year. Our benefits review encompasses evaluating quotes for dental, vision, and other insurance plans with the exception of medical insurance. We are currently collecting quotes and will soon evaluate our options. We are looking for the best value balancing costs with coverage and minimizing impa impact on employees. In, in quarter four, we roll out a pilot paid parental leave program. We will also use the HR portal this year to, for open enrollment for benefits, which will significantly reduce the manual data, reduce the manual data entry that our benefits managers and others in our staff have had to do in prior years. And finally, we are speaking with firms that can conduct a classification and compensation study for next year and hope to get that rolling later this fall. We have four programs in HR, the first of which is staffing. Our first goal under staffing is to evaluate our hiring process and practice and implement recommendations if necessary by the end of quarter one. Secondly, we plan on using, exist, using electronic forms to eliminate some of the paper processes by the end of quarter four. We have a lot of paper in HR. Our second program area is compliance. Our goals related to compliance are as follows. We plan on performing an audit of pay and leave policies and practices by the end of quarter four. We want each staff member to attend at least one networking event with other HR professionals to discover best or innovative HR practices. And we plan on publishing a revised version of the personnel manual by the end of the year. Some of the activities that we perform under employee relations are as follows. I think I got ahead of myself, sorry about that. Uh, reviewing and advising on disciplinary actions, coaching managers, investigating and responding to grievances, and participating in contract negotiations, it's a big part of what we do in, in employee relations. Goals in this program area include requiring harassment prevention for all new hires, requiring a diversity inclusion training and a preventing harassment training for all supervisors, distributing an internal department satisfaction survey to department heads by end of quarter four, and organizing three employee appreciation events by the end of quarter four. Many of those have been paused, as you know, because of COVID. So we're excited to get those back in action. Compensation, benefits, and employee development is our fourth and final program. Goals within this program include conducting an annual open enrollment survey, implementing a financially feasible employee health clinic, which we've already talked about a little bit, and implementing a classification and compensation study to be completed by the end of, of next year, Complete, exploring current and potential non-insurance benefits and recommending changes if warranted by the end of quarter two. The Human Resources Department budget request is $1,991,000. $198, and this represents a 34% change over the prior year. The personnel request is $1,677,000. This represents a $333,000, or 25% increase over the prior year, and also includes the 5% cost of living increase for all regular full-time and part-time employees. It also includes two new positions in the HR department, which will support our goal of attracting and retaining a diverse and highly qualified workforce. The Compensation and Benefits Director will oversee pay, insurance, and other benefit-related products, services, and programs for city employees. We will also add talent acquisition specialists who will primarily recruit police officers and firefighters, and will assist in the hiring of, all, of city employees as time allows. And both of these new positions are funded by ED Lit. Finally, we have added a 0.4 FTE to our part-time administrative assistant and planning to make this position full-time. In category two, our supplies request is $2,360 and represents no, represents no change over the prior year. Other suffers the request is $311,000 and represents 175,000 increase or 120% 
increase over the prior year. This includes $150,000 in ARPA funds for a pilot tuition reimbursement program and another $25,000 to help us implement recruitment strategies, primarily focused on public safety. We have no capital outlays in HR. This next slide is a summary of our human resources budget. And this also shows our departmental budget by fund. The 2023 human resources budget reflects increases that align with our mission of creating a positive, productive, and inclusive work environment that attracts, retains, and develops talent in order to accomplish our organizational goals. I thank you for your considerations of our 2023 budget request. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you for that report, Michelle. Um, we'll start on my right this time. Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. Um, you've made mention of a financially feasible health clinic as part of the new way to improve our employee relations or, or help with you know, uh, employee benefits. Is that going to be under the auspices of the HR department and how do we have any idea as to how that's gonna be executed and, and, and what the total costs of that are gonna be? Uh, I have been working on this for some time. That's a great question, thank you. We, uh, we're partnering with a third-party provider. I haven't selected, we haven't selected the actual provider yet, but I've been having a lot of conversations in conjunction with other local employers and also the AIM Medical Trust, our advisors with AIM. And we'll partner with another group that will open a clinic and we'll pay an, a monthly employee premium to, to support that. So it won't have a, that's, I won't have a capital, we won't have a capital investment, um, which it's, and after a lot of research and many years of thinking about this, it seems like the right way to do it. So, um, and I would say this, someone, maybe council member Piedmont Smith made a comment that our employees want different things, different employees want different things. A health clinic not only improves access to care, which is a big issue in this town, as many of you know, or maybe all of you know, it also helps with employee wellness and morale and provides services that, that we can't provide as an employer directly. It's a, it's a really good thing and I'm super excited about that. And so it will be under your supervision, under, under yes. HR? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rallo. Thank you, Ms. Shaw. Um, my question regards ASME negotiations, and are those ongoing? They are. Okay. Um, and will they be concluded uh, before we approve this budget in the fall? Uh, we, uh, so I, I, may, I probably should defer to uh, Beth Cape, my colleague who's leading negotiations. Okay. He speaks on behalf of all of us with regard to negotiations. Sorry to put you on this. Thank you. Fine. Uh, good evening, <clears throat> council members and council member Rallo. Thank you for the question. Uh, Beth Kate, Corporation Council. So I am the negotiating lead for the team that is in uh, bargaining negotiations right now with the AFSCME union. And our hope is to achieve an agreement with uh, the union for 2023 through 2026. Uh, we've been negotiating with them. I think your question was, will we, do we anticipate achieving an agreement with them before you finalize the budget this fall? I, I, I don't know the answer to that, uh, to be honest with you. I, I think that will depend. Our negotiations are ongoing, um, and uh, we will see. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, it does have a bearing, of course, on the, the total budget, so uh, I, I hope that we uh, we could have those uh, that concluded. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you Council Member Pete Smith. Yes, if I could follow up on that. So, what uh, placeholder figure is used for the current budget proposal for pay increases for ASME employees, or are they not in there at all? Is it flat flat pay as the placeholder? Controller Underwood, do you want to speak to that if you're still with us? Sorry, we were chatting and I didn't hear. Can you repeat the question, please? no longer please? with us, but I'll speak in this oh. place. Uh, Controller Jeff Underwood. Uh, since those negotiations have not been completed, uh, there's nothing included in the uh, current budget proposal. Uh, if for some reason we were able to get that 
settled uh, before uh, time to advertise and or approve the budget, we would certainly add those in. That 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 said, the thousand dollars per employee for um, as the mayor and, and uh, Ms. Shaw have talked about is budgeted. So you currently not budgeted any pay increases, any base pay increases for ASPE employees in this proposal. That is correct. That is uh, typically what we do. As there's been several occasions since I've been back that we were in the middle of negotiations with the uh, various uh, unions, and if we don't have an amount uh, agreed to, we do not put an amount in. So where would the money come from if the negotiations result in a increase of the base budget? Uh, it could come through uh, two ways. Is one that uh, typically there is enough money in the budget due to un un unspent monies that we would be able to cover it, or we would come back for additional appropriations in the various funds. Uh, Ask me is one of those uh, that's very different from police and fire. Police and fire typically out of the general fund. Uh, Ask me goes across uh, numerous uh, funds: uh, general fund, um, parks department. Uh, street, fleet, sanitation, uh, and uh, utilities. All right, thank you. I have a totally different question if I still have time. Um, Ms. Shaw, why do you need a new compensation and benefits director? So that we can actually focus on compensation and benefits to, completely. We, we've been we're, we're kind of, um, it's been such an important thing. It's something we've been thinking about for two or three years. and. In hindsight, I wish we had gotten it two or three years ago because someone just focused completely on compensation and benefits and can even start doing many salary studies so we stay current. As we go into the next negotiation with the next union, we could be pulling that data together. It's a very, um, it's, it's best practice and that's how we need that position. So do you expect if this position, new position is funded that you would uh, need fewer dollars for consultants? Yes, going forward, absolutely. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Council Member Smith. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation, Ms. Shaw. Um, so looking at, I, looking at the higher level, in, it says the budget is going to be up 34%, and then personnel is gonna be up 25%. So can you walk me through a little bit um, what's happening there so I understand what, what's going on because I mean, that's, a, that's a fair amount, fair increase, It is, right? and sometimes in the personnel line within HR, we have other, we have benefits for all city employees. I need to, I should just look that up and I'll report back on that through written questions, through written answers, if that's okay. You'll share it with all of us? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Council Member Volan. Yes, thank you, um, and thanks for the presentation. I missed what you said to Councilmember Sandberg about where the uh, new clinic would be housed. Where physically would it be? We don't yet know where it'll be housed, uh, but it'll likely be a near-site clinic, not necessarily, it won't necessarily be in a city building because it will be managed by a third party. It may be shared with another employer in town or multiple employers. That's a very common practice when you work with a third party. And, and the payment on it is per employee per month. So it's not gonna say uh, city health clinic. It'll be some generic third, uh, third party term that city employees know they can go to for care. You know, I'm, I'm out to pass on that question until we have an actual partner. I know how they're going to market it. It's a good question, though. But you said near side. Near, near, near side? site. So there, there. Are, I think there are three different options for clinics. One is on site, and it's a capital investment by the employer. Another is called a near site. And when, with the, with the situation with the city of Bloomington, have some having so many employees living outside of this county and sur in surrounding counties, ideally we'll find a partner who already has clinics set up in some of those surrounding counties. So it'll be easy mm -hmm. access for them as well, because having one clinic right at City Hall is not accessible for everyone is when you look at how well spread out our employees are. So you're saying it might not be a, a single site. There might be a company that operates more than one site and you, the city employee could go to whatever yes. clinic is most convenient. 
Yes. Um, and also, do you anticipate um, uh, some measurable amount of savings and health expenditures as a result of the clinic? We. It, it varies, uh, but I, th I think we, we, we think so. Uh, we're working very closely with our partners that aim to make sure there's a good cost justification for it. But as I said earlier, there are other reasons to open a health clinic, not just health savings. Of course. No, no. But, but I, yeah, no, I, I get that. But uh, it's interesting that there might be, uh, uh, I mean, so in other words, you see this as sort of a pilot as well. Hopefully not, but yes, probably. And the other thing I think, Councilmember Volan, that's really important about a health clinic, we, we know we have access to care issues in the city of Bloomington and other places as well. Mm -hmm. Get employees in to get their annual physicals, get their annual tests. You have a healthier workforce if people are being proactive in how they approach their health care. And that, to me, is just really important and a, and a total game changer for employees and investing in employees. By chance, have you uh, floated the idea of... Uh including the county? The county already thing? has a clinic. We have, we have talked to the providers oh, sorry, for I the forgot. county's clinic yeah. as well, and they're under consideration, certainly. Great, okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Scambolari. Yes, thank you. Um, going back to the presentation, and in particular the org chart with the proposed positions, uh, my question is similar to Council Member Piedmont Smith. In particular, could you talk more about that trio of positions, talent manager, which is new, talent coordinator, which currently exists, and then talent acquisition. I get that the talent acquisition will focus largely on strategic recruiting and public safety, um, but I'm not clear on how those positions, especially the two new ones, are, are supposed to interrelate. So that's a little confusing on our org chart. We're, re we're uh, re repurposing, for lack of a better word, a special pro a vacant position, a special projects manager that we haven't been able to fill for a variety of reasons into the talent manager and, and it's having them focus exclusively on recruitment. And it's like, it'll be a group, three people who work exclusively together on recruitment, helping employees hire, uh, employ, uh, helping departments make good hiring decisions. And one of our goals at some point would be to, it's a, well, it's a heavy lift to do the hiring process. It's a very time consuming process. So we hope to be able to provide even more resources for our hiring managers and even screen the resumes more carefully for them so not going through, you know, 50 or 60 resumes in some cases, trying to find the most, the people who meet the minimum requirements. So we're just going to try to provide more services, be more focused, be more proactive, be going to more, be going to recruiting events on college campuses, um, especially with the public safety. We are going to target certain areas and we're going to try to make sure we're, the city of Bloomington is a, has a presence at these important areas where we can recruit new public safety employees and other employees too. Which our little department is so fragmented where as I said we're all generalists, but to have people focused specifically on the most one of the most important things we do at the city is really important. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited about that. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for that. And just as a follow-up to that, what is your thinking thus far on how we measure the success of those positions? We are uh, looking at, just looking at the data, you know, how are, we, are we getting, we know where we're having shortfalls. We know we have issues in fire and police. And are we getting more candidates in to help fill those vacancies? And are they staying? Okay. So that sounds like two or three or four years worth of data will be needed to actually inform how these positions are playing out for us, not just one year, right? Probably. Okay. Thank you. And it will work really closely with our public safety chiefs who have, you know, have a really hard challenge ahead of them trying to recruit to these positions and it'll be a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Council Member Rawa. Thank you, Chair Sims. Uh, Ms. Shaw, in the interest, I'm trying to uh, accumulate some data that would uh, help me understand compensation and the effect of expenditures in terms of compensation uh, and so one gap that we have that Councilmember Piedmont Smith just uh, elucidated in her question was that we don't, we don't really have a placeholder right now for AFSCME employees. So uh, first of all, how many AFSCME employees do we have in total? I want to say it's right around 180, but I w I'm going to check that data and, and report back in, in a more official capacity. Okay, that would be helpful. And then let's just say as a placeholder, um, that uh, they achieve a 5% increase base salary like everyone else's. Uh, what would that consist of? Could you give us an estimate of that uh, when you 
correspond with us as well. Yes, I'm happy to. I'll work right. with Controller Under on that, on that as well. Okay, very good, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rosenbarger. Thank you, thank you, Michelle, for that presentation and the one before it. Thank you. I, I was just looking at the diversity, equity, and inclusion portion of your presentation or of the, the budget here. Uh, I wanted to say first thanks for including this and I feel very grateful for the work the city is doing in this world, um, specifically the 48 hours of training that is being offered to department heads and elected officials. I, I find it incredibly important to be there, and I think not only learning, but growing with the people who are in that space is invaluable to me, and I hope everyone there too. I wanted to ask about um, the percentages of um, basically women and then um, people of color in the city. This paragraph talks about um, a 2.2 percent increase from 2016 to, to 2020. Um, do we have numbers that that give us just the overall percentage of um, women and people of color in in the city, and then also in management roles? Do you mean currently? Yes. 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 We can get that for you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. Back to the talent acquisition specialist. Um, you're kind of talking about the difference between HR generalists and specialists. Will this particular individual have any kind of experience or expertise in working with police and fire departments? We certainly hope so. Well, I, I, I would think that given our shortfalls, I understand we're down to 81 officers now. We lost two again last week, one to Fishers and one to Columbus, I believe. And so whoever this individual is is going to need to have, I think, some special skills. So that is just my concern that uh, whoever this individual is can work very closely with Chief Moore and Chief Decoff in making sure we're identifying what exactly are the reasons why we're having such a problem and how they can go out and help. What, what would they do primarily market to? They will be at colleges. They will be at recruiting events. I've heard that and like in police, people show up at the academy to do recruitment. And I've, I've actually been talking to the police department specifically. I haven't had a chance to talk to Chief Moore about this, about I think it's helpful sometimes to have an officer with you. If you're not an officer yourself, someone you can help answer the question. So it really is a partnership and helping us, you know, us partnering with the public safety in their recruitment efforts. And someone who can talk fire, someone who can talk law enforcement. I think that's really important. So this individual is going to have to get out there and sell Bloomington. Yes, yes. Why Bloomington and not Fishers and Columbus? Exactly. And I, things, I'm thinking about things like working with our very talented director of communications and his staff in creating videos to help market the city of Bloomington. This is a great place to live. We need to be proud of living here in Bloomington and sell that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no more questions from council. Um, Mr. Lucas, do we have any public on Zoom. And while you're checking, I will remind folks that may be on Zoom that if you would like to make a public comment, please indicate by using the raised hand function on Zoom. Um, if you're on a mobile device, you can hit star nine to reach us. And if none of those work, please send us a note through uh, to the meeting host through the chat function on Zoom. And if we have anyone here in the chambers that wish to make public comments. Um, we can work our way toward the podium. Mr. Lucas. Not seeing any hands raised on Zoom at the moment. Okay, thank you. Do we have anyone here in person wish to make a public comment? Seeing none, Mr. Lucas, can you check one more time? No, no takers on Zoom. Thank you. We'll now return to council for any final comments um, before seeking a due pass recommendation. Uh, council member Rollo. Thank you and thank you for your presentation. I, I'll be passing this evening uh, because I simply need to consider uh, additions of uh, new positions in the city. Uh, well, in my view, we don't seem to be keeping pace with base salary increases. I understand that there's other forms of compensation, but you know, people need to pay rent, they need to pay for food, they need to pay for gas and so forth. Uh, that doesn't necessarily help them there. So uh, I'll need to consider this further, uh, so I'll be passing, thank you. 
Thank you. Council Member Flaherty. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'll be voting no um, out of a similar sentiment. I just usually make it a no vote uh, until I'm a yes, and when I, there's still things I'm reviewing and analyzing and uncertain about my support for, um, I'll plan to vote no generally uh, throughout the bu bu budget process, budget hearings. When that's my feeling, I'll vote yes sometimes, sure, uh, as well, I'm sure. But uh, I just wanted to share that generally as well as specific to this um, department's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Any further final comment from council? Okay, seeing none, again, thank you for the presentation, Ms. Shaw. Um, part of your presentation, this is a comment that we've made, we talked a lot about public safety. Um, and we also know that we have some staffing issues in like utilities and across the board and we're just short staffed. So I just wanna make sure that we're comprehensive um, on all these talent things or talent positions, I should say. I shouldn't call them talent things. Um, but I wanna make sure we get the right bang for our buck and understanding the challenges that we're facing and actually saying one thing and doing it. I wanna see that mesh. Um, but we can talk about that as we're moving forward. So uh, Council Member Sandberg. I'm sorry, I just thought to you. Uh, I too will be passing and it has nothing to do with uh, the information that we've heard per se, but we just got our budget books on Friday, and so I think just a little more time to absorb all of it in its totality, in addition to thinking about human resources. But a comment was made earlier about um, we have more, we can do more work without new staff, and hand staff was particularly noted, and uh, fleet managers, there are eight of them, and they're dealing with more vehicles, and so I do have concerns about staff shortages all across the board, and staff morale and um, conditions that maybe are causing people to uh, perhaps not want to work for the city of Bloomington. And so I want to put a little more thought into that before I do a yes vote on the, on the budget on this night. But uh, a pass just means I need to think a little more. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Seeing no more comments from council. I'm sorry, Council Member Volan. Up here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, most of the presentation that Ms. Shaw made, I found to be uh, acceptable and reasonable, although I share some of my colleagues' uh, concerns about um, their being unsure. Um, and I would uh, use that reason to abstain tonight, but or to pass rather, but um, I'm going to lump the parking cash out concerns that I have into the HR budget, so this is the first chance that we have to uh, vote on a budget uh, because it's being portrayed as a benefit along with many other items. And uh, as I said uh, to Mr. Underwood, I found uh, the relatively arbitrary determination of uh, how much the benefit should be to be uh, disappointing. Um, it shouldn't be a flat fee across the board. It should be whatever uh, the, what, the people should be able to cash out whatever they would normally spend to park to go to work uh, if they can find a more cost-effective way of uh, getting to work. Um, and so I, I didn't feel my question about um, how some people might get $500 back when they only normally would spend $200. Um, I found that just to be as arbitrary as somebody who would only get $500 back when they spend $700 just in order to, to go to work. So the, the idea behind parking cash out is that it's market-based um, and we should be doing that also with uh, our other parking prices. So um, for that reason, until I feel like that there's a better answer on parking cash out, I'll be voting no on the HR budget. Thank you. Council Member Rosenberg. Similar sentiment here that I haven't had um, a good amount of time yet to review the entire budget. So for the most part, I'll be passing. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Scambler. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm willing to support this budget. Uh, I especially like, I, I realize there are some questions and there's imperfect information. Um, but I like the direction we are heading with positions that can give us data. Um, so that we are so that we'll be able to make data-driven decisions around the benefits that we could offer that are most compelling so that we could get a better sense of why we're not retaining employees when we don't 
Um, so I appreciate the thought and the intentionality um, that has gone into some of those new positions. Uh, so I'll be supporting it this evening. I, like everyone else, I look forward to hearing more. Um, but I appreciate the direction that you've taken, um, particularly with staff. Council Member Smith. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the presentation as well. And I'm going to pass because I'm, I will just wait for to be able to review um, justification for uh, that increase in uh, personnel in the HR budget. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, seeing no more questions, are, are we ready for the question? Will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Volen? No. Sims? Yes. Scambellari? Yes. Sandberg? Pass. Rollo? Pass. Flaherty? No. Smith? Pass. Piedmont Smith? Pass. And Rosenbarger. Thank you, and I believe those numbers are two, two, and five. Two yes, two no, five pass. I think if my math is right, that equals nine. So thank you very much, and thank you, Ms. Shaw. Okay, we'll now go to the office of the clerk, Clerk Bowden. Thank you. My name is Nicole Bolden. I'm the Bloomington City Clerk. My pronouns are she, her. For those who are attending this evening who may be visually impaired or blind, I am a brown-skinned black woman who's wearing a white blazer over a black jumpsuit. So I did not get a time limit this year, unlike years past. And you all have been here before with me, and you know that my presentations tend to be fairly fast because I don't have a lot of changes in my budget. <sighs> so this year, I'm going to stick to past practice, and it will be fairly fast. Um, as you know, the Office of the City Clerk is defined in statute, so and in practice. We sit next to you, we work next to you, we have four full-time employees. There's all of us here. City clerk, chief deputy clerk, er, and two deputies. I neglected to include our intern, so you'll have to forgive me for that. But we serve as a record keeper for the council. We hear parking ticket appeals. We maintain the Bloomington Municipal Code. We have other duties. If you have any questions about them, I'm happy to run through them all for you. But at this point, I'm going to give you all a break and just kind of go through them quickly in terms of our slides. We're going to continue to staff the clerk and council space in the upcoming year and staff our council meetings and committee meetings. This year, we're going to continue to work on our certification programs and I'm going to stay here just a little bit longer and talk about our certifications. The state changed the rules for certifications and ongoing educations for clerks. I actually have to attend ongoing education. And so um, I don't remember exactly when I received my Indiana Accredited Municipal Clerk certification. I think it was in the last couple of years. I am also a certified municipal clerk. There are two organizations that offer those certifications. One is through the state, which is the Indiana League of Municipal Clerks and Treasurers. This year I started serving as an officer in that league. There's also the International Institute of Municipal Clerks, which is where you get the certified municipal clerks. I believe within the next year, Chief Deputy Clerk McDowell will be certified as an Indiana accredited municipal clerk. Thank you very much. And within the next year, she will also become a CMC. Is that correct? Okay, and within the next two years, I believe all of our clerk staff will have achieved their IAMCs. And that is huge. It takes years to receive those certifications. It's not quick. It's not easy. It involves classes. 
it involves attendance, and it involves membership. And through our certification programs, we're also able to receive additional DEI training. So not just the DEI training that is offered through the city, not just the training that is offered to department heads and elected officials, which I've seen some of you at that training, but we get additional training, which is how we know to offer our pronouns and talk about people who may be visually impaired. So I did want to point that out, and I will move on from here. Hopefully, we'll be offering more weddings again. Um, <clears throat> I always talk about how weddings are my favorite part of my job. I mean, I love seeing you all, but weddings are awesome. <laughs> and we'll continue to engage in public engagement and outreach. We sponsor activities, and we do outreach with other groups, um, with black and brown and LGBTQ, group, LGBTQ plus groups, and that helps in terms of our office, and that helps in terms of getting boards and commissions staffed. So we have a lot of boards and commissions, and there are times when we have difficulty getting people involved. This is part of how we do so. It's by showing up. This year, our budget increase is relatively small. It's about 5%, mostly in the personnel category. It's the cost of living increase, which is where you're going to see most of it. I know when you look at the percentage category, Mr. Smith, I noticed you looked at the category, the percentages in other categories. If you see seven and eight percent, it looks huge, but our budget is relatively small, so $400 can be seven percent. It's not big. And this is it. So thank you for our consideration. There's our staff, jazz hands. And I'm here for any questions. Thank you. We'll now go to now go to our council members. Do we have any questions for Clerk Bolden? Council members Gumbler. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Congratulations on the certifications and, <laughs> and the continuing education of Brava. I mean, that's very, very exciting. So thank you for that good work. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more about the role of interns in your office. Um, I think we, we automatically tend to pay most attention to our full-time positions, but could you comment on some of the projects you have them working on, some of the contributions they make as well? Yes. Um, wow. So we have had interns in our office, I think since, well, actually since I first started with the city 13 years ago, and they have several ongoing projects that they're working on. And at this point, I would actually defer to Chief Deputy McDowell because she tends to work with them more closely than I do. Hi, Sophia McDowell, Chief Deputy Clerk. Um, we have a lot of ongoing kind of back burner projects that our interns are able to um, assist with and actually take the lead with. One of the goals I think it's fair to say is we want them to get a really good um, internship experience with us. So we do encourage them to take the lead with telling us what sorts of projects they would like to work on. Um, a couple that I can think of off the top of my head, there are several um, dozen years worth of cassette tapes worth of meet meetings, council meetings, that we are currently digitizing and will eventually draft minutes for, um, and, and we'll see what the next steps are with those. Um, our, our intern, Riley Foster, also does assist with parking ticket appeals. Um, and there are uh, a couple other projects that I think we will begin in the fall when she returns, which I believe is next week. It might be the following week. Um, and, and I'll highlight that these are uh, projects that we really, the full-time staff, do not have the resources to address, but they need to be um, started and completed. And our interns help with that. Thank you. And I, I don't want to make any assumptions, but um, where do our interns come from? Is it IU or Ivy Tech or local high schools or all of the above? All of the above. Okay. We have had interns from Ivy Tech, local high schools, and IU, but predominantly IU. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any further questions from council members? Okay. Seeing none, we'll now go to the public. If there's any public comment, Mr. Lucas, do we have anyone? online. 
I'll just remind members of the public if they'd like to offer public comments on the clerk's department uh, budget, you can indicate your desire to speak by using the raise hand feature in Zoom. You can find that under the reactions tab or the more tab in your control bar. If you're not able to locate that, please send a chat to the uh, host and we can recognize you that way. Thank you. And at the moment, I don't see any takers on Zoom. Okay, and do we have anyone here in the chambers that wish to make public comment in person? Seeing none, do we have anyone else yet, Mr. Lucas? No, not that okay. I see. Thank you, and before we go to council, final comment, uh, Clerk Bolton, did you have something else to add? There was just one little bit of history that I was going to add about the Indiana Clerks League. You have, which, you have 30 seconds, go for it. The second president of the Clerks League was our own Mary Alice Dunlap, who was our mayor. Thank you. Didn't know if y'all knew that. I thought it was Thank fun. Thank you. All right, and we'll now return to council for any final comments before we do a uh, do pass recommendation. Councilmember Allo. Just to say thank you for your uh, your staff and your help for council. It's invaluable to us, and uh, I'll be voting yes on this budget. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any more final comments? Councilmember Volan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to echo Councilman Rallo's uh, comments and say that we very much appreciate the work of the clerk's office um, and that uh, to add to the visual description, the clerk tonight is sharply dressed. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no comments on that. Thank you. Do we have any more final comments? Um, I see none. I plan to support um, your presentation, your budget as well. Um, and we've talked a lot, you and I, and I think you know how important I find uh, community engagement, and in particular through our boards and commissions. So at some point I'd really like to hear, and I know there's hard work, and we do outreach and we work hard. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering if there's a way that we could have better outreach to get better outcomes. I don't know how it is, but <laughs> I'm looking forward to that because that is the key I think to community involvement. Um, not everyone can sit up here, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, but almost everyone can participate in boards or commissions or in other efforts to be a part of the city. So thank you very much. And seeing no more comments, I believe we're ready for due pass recommendation. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes. Scambolari? Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. And Volden? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that due pass recommendation was 9 0 0. Thank you very much, Clerk Bolden. We will now move to legal department. Good evening, council members. Beth Kate, Corporation Counsel for the City of Bloomington. I, I want to start out, as others have done, thanking uh, the great attorneys and staff who work in the legal department. I am new, as you know, relatively speaking, to uh, the city, and I feel privileged to work with a group of attorneys and support staff who have uh, just constantly been characterized by a tremendous work ethic, by generosity of time and talent, uh, by the deepest integrity and uh, by a lot of good humor as well. Um, so I want to publicly thank them for their great work tonight. So I won't read this lengthy statement out. Uh, I, I will simply emphasize in terms of why we exist, we serve the city's legal needs, and I want to emphasize the breadth of service that we provide. It encompasses transactions, litigation, managing risk, uh, and advising across a host of local, state, and federal issues. We handle most matters in-house. We use outside counsel when we lack specialized expertise that is needed for the particular matter. 
Uh, as uh, you're probably aware, we have 13 uh, FTEs in the office. Uh, that encompasses eight lawyers, one of whom also serves as the human rights director for the city. Uh, we have a risk manager, a director of safety and training, and three support staff encompassing a paralegal and two administrative assistants. Currently, the uh, legal department includes three divisions, legal, risk, and human rights. Uh, we are proposing, and you will see this reflected, I think, if you've seen the organizational chart for legal for 2023 and you've had a chance to look at our budget memo, we are proposing uh, to move to the Community and Family Resources Department, the Human Rights Commission, the Human Rights Director position, and the non-legal activities supporting the Commission's work. Uh, that is a proposal we are making, uh, in having discussed this uh, with uh, CFRD, um, with the support of the current uh, Human Rights Director, Barbara McKinney, who will sadly be retiring at the end of uh, December. Um, and the idea behind this is that uh, a city attorney would continue to provide legal advice and support to the commission, to the director, and to the human rights function of the city. Uh, but CFRD is an excellent fit and a natural fit for the non-legal activities, and there are many excellent non-legal activities that uh, are encompassed within the city's human rights program. So uh, while Barbara McKinney's particular shoes will always be tough to fill on anything she does, we're 100% confident that these activities will continue to grow and thrive at CFRD. Uh, and the changes would allow the legal department to uh, gain significant lawyer and support staff time without having to add new positions. The major initiatives we've been engaged in over the last year uh, include annexation, uh, the Meridium Fiber Agreement and the related uh, tax increment financing district, advising on ongoing major redevelopment projects, such as Hopewell, for example, advising on major city financing issues, including EDLIT, which you've already heard uh, many references to, uh, and bond issues for parks and public works and utilities, uh, negotiating new um, uh, police and AFSCME agreements, which has uh, also been referred to uh, earlier, um, and then our ongoing uh, initiatives, reducing risks related to city operations and supporting the city's goals for sustainability uh, and climate action and equity and inclusion. I will say the legal department also offers strategic advice on policy issues and actions to maximize the city's ability to advance its goals and the goals of its community against uh, what can be a challenging state and federal law landscape. So examples would be uh, this year advising on options in response to national developments in abortion law and state legislation on guns and gun rights, uh, reviewing a U.S. Supreme Court amicus brief in a major human rights case that's going before the court uh, will be heard uh, in the next term starting in October and advising on whether the city should join that brief. So just to give you some examples. Uh, just quickly, uh, we had 21 um, budget goals for 2022. These slides do not list all of them, but uh, this slide and the following four slides illustrate various budget goals for 2022 as they were listed in uh, uh, your earlier um, presentation from last year. I'm happy to answer questions about any of the 2022 budget goals if you have them. Um, uh, the Fraternal Order of Police uh, agreement for 2023 to 2026 was achieved on May 18th when this council ratified uh, or approved the, uh, the deal that the city had negotiated with that union. As we've discussed already tonight, uh, negotiations are ongoing with the AFSCME union. Uh, with respect to the goal of advising boards and commission members, um, staff has already spent uh, 815 total hours uh, advising board and commission members. That's about 90.5% of the projected time for the year. Uh, under the heading of legal and policy documents, the legal uh, department um, goals have been divided historically in terms of legal counsel, legal and policy documents, litigation, human rights, and risk. And so that's what you're seeing reflected in these slides. Uh, goals from 2022 under legal and policy documents, you can see here uh, the staff has negotiated, uh, reviewed, drafted, revised, brought to execution 445 contracts for city departments. That's about 61% of the goal. This is through uh, July 
uh, the figures that you're getting tonight. Um, and staff have drafted 174 resolutions and 18 ordinances for boards and commissions, including the city council, and that is 85% of the projected goal uh, from 2022. Under litigation, uh, our goals are not uh, susceptible to uh, quantitative assessment, but basically we continue to have the same goals. We manage litigation in-house wherever possible and achieve the best possible outcomes, and we assist uh, and or manage outside counsel that handle litigation on the city's behalf. Uh, legal department staff serve as lead counsel in many cases involving the city, ranging from code enforcement to constitutional litigation, and the department's goals continue to be the same with respect to that in-house managed litigation. Similarly, we provide substantial support to outside counsel handling litigation for the city. Among other support activities, we provide strategic direction to outside counsel, we review and edit filings, we gather and review city records and other materials needed to support litigation, we help prepare witnesses, et cetera. Uh, within the human rights function currently housed within the uh, legal department, uh, the couple of the goals from 2022 are reflected here. Uh, we have had seven human rights complaints received, six have been investigated and resolved, and a seventh is pending. Uh, staff have reviewed and uh, received and reviewed 43 conflicts forms to date out of a possible 52 given to current board and commission uh, position vacancies. Not all boards and commissions have memberships that, uh, and have functions that require them to do uh, conflicts of interest, financial conflicts of interest disclosures. Um, so that's why you're seeing numbers here that, or you're hearing numbers from me that don't reflect all boards and commission members. Um, but we've already uh, received and reviewed 83% of the conflicts forms that uh, we would receive and review throughout the year and staff are following up to uh, collect the outstanding forms and actually have uh, suggested that um, for meetings of boards and commissions that uh, do require these forms of their members, uh, that we take some time at the start of meetings to get any outstanding forms completed because I think it's just a matter of people not finding that they have time to do it or they're not thinking about it. Okay. Under the heading of risk uh, and risk management, we have already achieved uh, last year's goal of, or this year's goal of providing training on risk prevention. Staff have actually completed 95 risk training sessions, which is nearly 200% of the goal, and 353 safety audits, which is 136% of that goal. In terms of reducing insurance claims by 3%, uh, casualty claims are down, auto claims are up, workers' compensation claims are up compared with the same time in 2021. But mid-year cost comparisons are problematic because claims and charges are not resolved uh, at this point. So um, we'll know much more at the end of the year. Okay. For 2023, we have 30 goals within the legal department, and I am not going to uh, go through all of them, although they're all on these slides. Uh, the goals uh, are basically across now to what would be two proposed divisions, legal and risk, and the sa uh, four categories, legal counsel, legal and policy documents, litigation and risk. So again, human rights with the non-legal portion of human rights activity if that moves with council's approval because it will take an ordinance change actually and we will be coming to the council to explain more about that uh, and uh, present a proposed, excuse me, a proposed ordinance change. Um, but if that's approved, some of the, uh, um, the functions that we perform, we will continue to perform the legal advising to that function and that's reflected in uh, goals that have been absorbed under legal counsel in other areas. So I'm not going to read out all of these goals. Um, they're included in the memo. The things that I will highlight about them is uh, one of our 2022 goals was to develop a template for board and commission onboarding and training. Uh, we're working on materials now, and in 2023, our goal is to then use them to deliver that onboarding and training. Uh, and also, we're building into those materials a quarterly reminder of compliance obligations uh, regarding meetings and other things that uh, board and commission members need to uh, um, keep in mind. Okay. Uh, these goals also include various system enhancements aimed at increasing efficiency and transparency, for example, 
uh, creating a manual to help onboard new attorneys and capture the vast institutional knowledge we are about to lose. We have two uh, retirements coming up this fall. Uh, I mentioned Barbara McKinney already. Uh, Jackie Moore is also retiring. They take with them not only a tremendous amount of talent, uh, but a tremendous amount of institutional knowledge. And in order to ensure that we don't lose that, uh, one of the things that we are doing is uh, creating a manual to uh, help preserve that knowledge and also help then transition new attorneys. I should mention we also are losing Daniel Dixon to his first love, uh, the Lawrence County Public Defender's Office. And he's also tremendously talented. And so we're capturing his knowledge as well uh, before he goes. Um, and that project will be a living project and will continue th into and be uh, hopefully uh, achieved in a form that will be solid uh, in 2023 and, and it will continue to uh, add information as uh, our practice continues. Um, establishing a cradle to grave digital environment for producing, executing and maintaining agreements and contracts. Providing additional information to the public via our website and uh, public records request software um, that we are investigating now, okay, in uh, collaboration with the innovation director for the city. So the rest of these slides show all of the 30 goals that I've just mentioned. Uh, one thing that I should also highlight is just uh, the county has reached out to us about merging our human rights commission with theirs and we're in conversations with them about that too. If that were to happen, that would also come before council because it would require an ordinance uh, change and the county's actually working on a draft and our local agreement to present to us to take a look at uh, to assess that. But, uh, but it's, it sounds like a very positive um, opportunity. Um, okay, uh, all of the rest of these are goals. I, don't know how much time you want to spend looking at these. You have them all in your materials. Uh, so I will just go ahead and um, move on to our budget request. So our budget request is uh, $2,187,230, and that is an increase of $67,655, or 3%. The increase is almost entirely in the personnel services category. It basically reflects the COLA that you've already seen and heard about um, from uh, the uh, controller's office and from HR. Uh, and the only other uh, minor adjustments are a uh, slight decrease in our other services, um, which typically includes our outside council services, um, and a slight, very slight increase in supplies uh, that is uh, within our risk function. So <coughs> uh, I will say that um, we, we do obviously spend a significant amount of our overall budget. Uh, this is a budget breakdown by fund um, but to go to uh, our two, uh, 2023 budget, you can see personnel and other services largely encompassing outside council services and consulting services um, are really where you see the, the bulk of our budget. Uh, so that is uh, our budget ask and our budget request reflects increases that align with, uh, with our stated goals. Um, so I thank you for your consideration of this, I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Ms. Kate. Um, we'll go to the council now, council member Scambolari. Yes, thank you. <coughs> Can you go back to the slides and to the budget, sorry, <laughs> to the budget request table that you laid out? Um, oh, almost. So if I understood you correctly, Ms. Kate, thank you for the presentation, by the way. The sure. 752 287 is almost exclusively outside counsel? It's consulting services and outside counsel services, yeah. How much well. of, I mean, just ballpark, how much of that might be focused on outside counsel for some of the specialized? It's, it's broken up across the different categories, so litigation, uh, legal counsel, legal and policy documents. Uh, and risk and HR. So um, there are 
portions within each of those categories that uh, pertain to outside counsel. I can get you more detailed you, figures yeah. if you want it. Yeah, I can follow up with that. And what are the a follow up to that is what are the areas in which we we rely most heavily on outside counsel? Sure. I think annexation is one. We have bond counsel. Annexation is one. Bond counsel is another. With respect to the Meridium Fiber deal, we had telecommunications counsel uh, that provided a significant um, amount of assistance in an area that we don't have in house expertise in. We also within our budget we encompass our government relations. Uh, counsel and, and consultants and funding. So at the federal level, at the state uh, level, for example, um, those uh, folks who are working um, up in the legislatures uh, also come under our budget for other services. So, yeah. That's helpful. Thank you very mm -hmm, much. Sure. Council Member Rollo. Thank you, Ms. Kate, for the very thorough. Um, Presentation, uh, I had a follow-up on Councilmember Scamillary's question related to uh, legal and financial consultants uh, mm -hmm. specific to annexation. Mm -hmm. So you could have a breakdown that, uh, that sp <coughs> is specific to annexation. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would assume that we are devoting staff hours. Do you, do you tally those staff hours related to annexation? Uh, we don't keep formal track of the hours for our own staff for mm -hmm. annexation, but they are uh, very significant, um, mm -hmm. I will say. They have been and they, they continue to be with the litigation we're involved in now. Um, but yes, I'm happy to provide you with a breakdown of outside counsel hours. Okay, I can try to estimate the in-house uh, ones as well if that's useful. That would, that would be helpful. I'm trying to grapple with the total cost of our annexation mm -hmm. um, litigation. Thank you. Sure. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Thank you. Um, I was looking at your organizational chart and comparing it with last year. So it, it looks like you're changing one assistant city attorney position to a, just a city attorney position. No. Is that just a typo or? Uh, I have to look. Is there a typo? Oh, it's a ty it's a typo. Okay. <laughs> There's only one city attorney. <laughs> I thought I thought as much. Okay. Yeah. Great. Sorry about the no. That's a typo. And then um, the other question I had was about the um, options to addressing the 2020 census undercount. Mm -hmm. um, can you share anything with us at this time as to what the strategies are to pursue? Uh, revision of that count, which I believe we're, we're looking at, right. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, I was just saying, which, which I believe, and many of us who work in the city and live in the city believe was incorrect. Yeah, let me follow up with you with more detail on that. Uh, but we are looking at the different types of ways that the government provides for you to supply information or questions about whether or not the census count was accurate. And, um, and there's sort of a, a range of different things that we've been looking at. So I'm happy to follow up with some more information on that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that is among our goals. You may have seen it in the, yeah, I yeah, saw for that. 2023. I was curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sure. Council Member Bolin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, couple of questions. Um, one is uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the uh, idea you have for? Uh, migrating human resources to CFRD. About how many hours of staff time does that represent? Um, so, uh, with respect to the department now. I'm sorry, I missed the last part of what you just said. I... To, to the legal department, you know, currently, how, about how many hours are being transferred? To, uh, do you know, let me go back and double check the figures, but it was comprising about, I believe, 35 to 40% of Barbara McKinney's time, one of our city attorneys, so she was serving as the human rights director, and our uh, support staff, uh, who is, was supporting and has been supporting uh, the human rights function as well. Um, it comprises uh, at least that much of her time, and I think possibly more. So let me follow up to get the specifics um, on that and make sure I don't Well, but that gives them. me a sense it's, of it. It's a lot. Uh, yeah. yeah it's, it's about a half half time position it sounds like yeah yeah it's yes it is close um, to that yes 
Are you suggesting that um, the human rights director uh, will become part of somebody else's portfolio or will that be a separate um, position like somebody will just do that under CFRD? Well, uh, and I, I should let Beverly uh, Calendar Anderson, who's the director of CFRD, talk more about the details of how they will handle that within uh, that department. I can tell you that we have had conversations <coughs> with CFRD, and um, there is currently a member of staff who is very interested in taking on this role. This is an existing member of staff and would take on those responsibilities, possibly transfer some other things that he is doing currently elsewhere, but I really should defer to uh, Beverly Callender Anderson about okay. how she wants to handle that. Um, what I guess I would say from our standpoint is, uh, is that the types of activities that we were looking at um, and identifying as things that could be done by non-lawyers and done very well by non-lawyers didn't require legal expertise necessarily to do. That's what we were looking at in order to uh, say, is there a better home for this? And can we thereby uh, gain some additional lawyer capacity uh, and support staff capacity for the core legal functions of the office um, without having to hire and other so, positions? And so the legal department will still provide legal support to CFRD in that Absolutely. that function. Absolutely. In fact, okay. within our I've goals, I've got another question. Yeah. Oh, uh, my time is up. Uh, I've got another question about the census. I'll come back if there's time. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions from council? Okay. Seeing none, we'll now go to public comment. Uh, for anyone that's online, oh, we'll I remind you to use if you have public comment. Chairman Sims, I think uh, Council Member Volan had another question. Council Member Volan. I can, I can wait till after public comment. Yes. Okay. Well, for a comment. I can wait till after public comment. Yeah, for a comment, he'll have for a three question. minutes. Okay. If there's anyone in, in, uh, on Zoom who wishes to make a public comment, you please use the raised hand function, um, or you can reach us on mobile phone by using star nine or you can send a note to the meeting host if neither of those opportunities work for you. Um, you will be allowed two minutes for public comment. Uh, Mr. Lucas, do we have any takers? Okay, thank you. We will go in-house to public comment and we do have one person up here. Please identify yourself and you'll have two minutes. Hi, thanks. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, my name is Greg Alexander. Um, in 2019, you all passed a new transportation plan, which I'll summarize as basically saying that bicyclists and pedestrians are traffic as important as cars. A huge change, and I thank you all. Um, and just after that, you split engineering into its own department, which now has to establish new interdepartmental relationships in the light of these new priorities, um, a monumental task. Uh, and as a result of these actions you've taken, I've been trying to get engineering um, to recognize that Beeline users are traffic and that when state law assigns responsibility for all traffic signs in the city to engineering, that includes the Beeline. And I've met a rather surprising wall, which I think, you know, I guess I can't really be 100% sure, is based on advice from city legal to department heads. I've been told directly that Parks and Rec is exempt from state law. That's obviously false. Um, and it's not helpful to the enormous challenge faced by the Director of Engineering in establishing a new city department. And I fear it's symptomatic of a troubling trend I've seen from our legal department. I remember when legal informed the plan commission that they could hear the petition for the 4th Street garage design even though it included property the city didn't own. And at that time, the plan commission had been meeting behind closed doors with the administration, also under advice of city legal. More recently, legal told the Historic Preservation Commission that they could unilaterally amend a pet petition. They can't. And they've been telling this body that it's re reasonable to apply arbitrary quid pro quo to an alley vacation. All of that advice was blatantly false. And at least once, they have already been corrected in court. It's not just me saying this. Lawyers have a deep and nuanced, uh, nuanced ethical sense. Their ethical duty to their client often forces them to take actions that seem unethical to others. I'm worried that often when they are advising our officials, they are essentially representing the mayor's office against the rest of the city. I think it would be helpful if they were clear that they are providing advice, whether they are working for or against the parties they are advising. When they're speaking to council, it's essential to know if they're representing the administration against the council. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. 
Do we have anyone else for public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll return to council for final comment. Um, council member Volan, you have about three minutes, please. Oh, I had a question. I th um, uh, I'll check with Mr. Lucas, but I think within the three minutes that you have in comment, I think your question is um, proper. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kate, uh, you mentioned the census, and uh, I wanted to know, uh, I mean, you may have seen in June that I uh, presented data from the 2010 and 2020 censuses uh, explicitly demonstrating the undercount in the IU dorms, um, that there were at least 3,500 undercounted students between censuses. Um, and I wonder if you have been in contact with um, the appropriate departments at IU, residential programs and services in particular, to work with them. Uh, I mean, we have a shared interest in this case of getting the census count uh, changed. Mm -hmm. uh, have you reached out to them? Is there any uh, conversation directly involving IU producing data that would show, I mean, it's a state agency uh, that houses people. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, I do. First, I agree that there is a shared interest, uh, and I agree that we should be sharing data and working together. I have not personally had conversations, but I believe that Mary Catherine Carmichael has uh, spoken with them, and I believe that this issue is going to be coming up in our <coughs> next town gown discussion uh, as well. So, so thank I'm you. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that, although I would urge you not to underestimate the university's uh, interest in shall we call it hoarding data. So uh, it'd be nice if they would uh, report out. Thank you for that. Uh, just to conclude uh, my comments uh, on the budget, um, uh, I uh, find it to be uh, a not particularly uh, controversial one. Um, uh, although I'm intrigued by Mr. Alexander's uh, uh, thoughts, um, I also uh, uh, pleased to hear of the uh, the, the, the arrangement that CFRD and legal are making, uh, it sounds like it might be uh, the right uh, uh, organizational plan, although uh, I don't know enough right now to, uh, to comment more intelligently on it. But, um, uh, you know, I also want to take this opportunity, if I don't get one later in the year, to thank uh, Barbara McKinney for her many years of service to the city. She's been a very devoted uh, employee of the city and has served many, many people well in her tenure. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. Well, I too would like to uh, offer my congratulations to Barbara McKinney for her uh, re uh, upcoming retirement at the end of the year. I'm pretty sure she is pretty responsible for maintaining that top 1% rating in the annual municipal equality index. Uh, so she has worked very hard and very long on behalf of the city and will be missed, as will Jackie Moore. We do have a lot of institutional knowledge walking out the door, and um, that, that is worth noting. Um, um, I would like a little more information on the breakdown of outside counsel uh, before I make up my mind on this budget. So I will be passing, but again, for the most part, um, it looks like many of the changes seem to be um, reasonable as well. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yeah, I'm going to be passing on the budget uh, for the legal department tonight, specifically because I feel that uh, we as a city, and I know this is more than one department, but legal is certainly, certainly affected. We as a city have done a terrible job in enforcing our scooter rules for parking and utilizing scooters on public property. And um, I you know, the feedback I've, I've gotten so far from uh, people in the mayor's administration has been, oh, we're still in a wait and see period. Well, we have waited and we have seen that scooter companies and scooter users are not following the regulations that this body passed. And it's, it's way past time to start invoking fees and other legal measures against them. So um, for that reason, I'm going to pass on this particular budget, and I'll ask more questions when we get to uh, ESD and other departments. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Rollo. Well, I'll be 
passing this evening for the reasons that have just been described by my colleagues. One is uh, uh, pending further information regarding uh, outside financial consultants and staff hours devoted to annexation, but also I'm concerned about the scooter problem as well. Um, as a matter of fact, I think we ought to maybe consider uh, whether we're going to renew contracts with them uh, if enforcement isn't forthcoming. So uh, hoping to get more information about whether that policy will change. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. Uh, didn't intend to comment, but the scooter uh, comments led me to want to share an anecdote, which is that recently I was uh, commuting to um, a presentation uh, at, at a different building that I normally go to for work, and I didn't want to be all sweaty, so I took a scooter. I had a very difficult time parking my scooter on campus um, because they use geofencing to limit where you can park. Uh, I literally could not end my ride until I identified the nearest parking spot. The only reason this was frustrating to me is because not all the bike racks were included in their geofencing. So I actually had to go to three or four bike racks that were empty. Uh, these were not uh, within the, the, the area prescribed, so I had to go a couple blocks away and then walk back, which was unexpected. But it illustrates how easy it could be uh, for us to uh, regulate this in addition to you know using the fines and escalating um, options with that uh, via Bloomington Municipal Code. So just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Final comments from council members. Seeing none, I think, are we ready for due process recommendation? Will the clerk please call the roll? Council member Scambellari? Yes. Sandberg? Pass. Rollo? Pass. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Pass. Piedmont Smith? Pass. Rosenbarger? Yes. Follin? Yes. And Sims. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. And that vote is 504. 504. Thank you, Ms. Kate. We'll now move to information and technological technology services. Good evening, Mr. Dietz. Good evening, council members. Are you ready? All right. Hello, I'm Rick Dietz, director of the city's Information and Technology Services Department, more succinctly known as ITS. I appreciate the opportunity to present the 2023 ITS budget proposal for your consideration. In ITS, our mission is to provide the IT services, tools, training, and resources necessary to maintain mission-critical city systems, empower city staff to excel in their work, to improve digital equity in our community, and electronically engage our residents in their own governance. Ultimately, our work in ITS is as much about people as it is about technology. So I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and commend ITS staff for their continuing hard work and excellence supporting our public and staff customers. ITS provides broad information technology and communications technology support for all city departments. In the next few slides, I'll share the status of some of our 2022 goals currently underway. Here are some of our 2022 highlights. In 2022, we've built on our broadband work and implemented digital equity strat uh, strategic plan recommendations, including securing an infrastructure partner in Meridian to build a community-wide open access fiber network. Earlier this month, we awarded our third annual digital equity grant, uh, grants rounds, and our 2022 network upgrade plans have been unfortunately pushed back by su uh, supply chain delays, but we're now beginning to receive awaited gear and we'll catch up as best we can in the remainder of 2022 and 2023. This year, we've been replacing aging hardware across our organization and we've been working to reduce our susceptibility to social engineering cyber attacks through training and education of city staff. 
all the while maintaining high standards for the availability and reliability of our critical IT infrastructure and core digital services. There's a lot more that we've been up to in 2022, but those are some highlights. Next, I'd like to share some big themes from our 2023 budget. One of them is to protect, protect and preserve the basics, uh, the basic functions of city government. It's no secret that if IT systems don't work, then the city doesn't work. Network, phones, fi uh, virtual servers, file storage, backup, et cetera, require attention and resources to keep running and up to date. Planning is a big part of what we do, whether it's the ITS organizational review, strategic plan, capital plan, or digital equity strategic plan, we've developed solid plans and are making progress every year. In 2023, um, we're, we'll be returning to more normal spending patterns. Uh, the significant one-time capital expenses from 2022 are not present in the 2023 budget, which means will result in a significant decrease in overall uh, IT, uh, ITS spending. We have important uh, new funds available in 2023. The Economic Development Lit provides ITS 465,000 annually for IT infrastructure, cybersecurity, and CAT support. This is particularly important given the declining telecommunications non-reverting fund. And the Digital Equity Fund will receive 85,000 annually from the Meridium Partnership. This will support a new digital equity specialist and navigator position and other digital equity expenses. And it will help us achieve even more of our digital equity strategic plan goals. Equity and inclusion is all the more critical with the continuing impacts of the pandemic. We need to extend the promise of technology to all of our residents. And we're doing that work through grants, through the proposed City Digital Equity Specialist and Navigator position, and the Joint City Meridium Digital Equity Initiative. That initiative, as you know from our presentations uh, earlier this year, will provide income eligible households with 250 megabits per second up and down service with zero sign up in sign up fees at essentially a zero dollar monthly rate factoring in federal subsidies. It's a compelling program and it will begin in earnest in 2023. Cybersecurity has always been critical, but we are stepping up in 2023 with network up grades, new threat monitoring, mitigation systems, and enhanced staff training. In partnership with the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security a Agency, also referred to as CISA, we're continually monitoring and working to improve our security posture. And we're constantly working to improve efficiency and sustainability as well through process improvement, paper reduction, and document management and scanning. These are our overall thematic areas in 2023. Now let's explore our 2023 goals. In 2023, we will be we'll support and monitor the Meridium Fiber Project for the city to, ins, uh, to ensure the success of that project. We'll implement at least two digital equity strategic plan recommendations to improve broadband access to vulnerable populations. We'll be establishing a digital equity fund, which will, uh, uh, which will take in as uh, revenue 85,000 in annual funding from the Meridian Partnership to connect low income households to Meridian's open access fiber network and to support other digital equity programs. We also will be administering, awarding and monitoring 50,000 in our 223 round of digital equity grants to support local organizations bridging the digital divide. We'll be developing a smart city strategic plan in partnership with the city's innovation office. We'll co-lead the data analysis support group, uh, holding support and training meetings throughout 2023, and implement at least two new document management workflows to improve operations and efficiency. We'll also establish automated monitoring of the city's GIS services to improve support and reduce downtime. 
We plan to deploy five new ArcGIS internal support applications to improve department operations throughout the city. We'll be org organizing and executing uh, enterprise-wide network upgrade at city facilities, which, uh, as I mentioned before, has been delayed due to supply chain issues, but we intend to execute on that fully in 2023. And we'll ensure high uptime for the city's network uh, at primary city uh, facilities to uh, ensure that our operations are secure and stable. We'll complete the migration of our servers, network gear, and associated equipment to the Trades District Garage Data Center facility, organize and execute the annual capital replacement of approximately 25% of the city's desktop inventory in uh, 2022 as well. And then we'll achieve or exceed industry uh, fish-prone percentage targets for our uh, size of government organization, which indicates that uh, our staff are uh, trained and uh, able to protect themselves and our organization against uh, phishing-based cyber attacks. This covers our 2023 uh, goal highlights. Now let's turn to our actual budget. ITS budget, um, our ITS budget comes from several funds. The ITS General Fund, tele Telecommunications Non-Reverting Fund, the Electronic Map Generation Fund, and Enhanced Access Fund. Of note, the Telecommunications Non-Reverting Fund draws its revenue from the franchise fees paid by state video franchisees operating in Bloomington. This fund is in decline and has been in decline for quite uh, some time due to cord kidding and a shift from traditional uh, cable TV. Uh, and over the past few years, we've moved many ITS expenses out of the telecom fund accordingly. In addition, uh, starting in the 2023 budget, ITS will receive funding from the ED LIT for infrastructure and cybersecurity expenses and from the new digital equity fund established to support uh, the city's digital equity efforts with Meridium contributing 85,000 uh, annually to this fund. You know, as um, you know, with that uh, being noted, now we'll take a look at our various budget lines. Several have notable changes that I want to bring to your attention. The ITS general fund uh, budget request uh, for ITS is $3,132,488. This is a decrease of $1,400,000. Significant highlights from the general fund proposal are as follows. In personnel uh, services, we're requesting uh, approximately $2 million, which is an increase of $80,000. Uh, to support the cost of living uh, increases and the addition of a new permanent part-time digital equity specialist position. In category uh, three, there's a number of items there in our uh, management fees, consultants, and workshops line. We have a decrease of 173,000, which represents a removal of the 2022 uh, expenses in the same in the telephone line with a decrease in 149,000 in expenses that we budgeted for last year. Also in category three, hardware and software maintenance, we have an increase of 40,000 for cybersecurity investments, including updated antivirus and uh, DNS domain name service security. In dues and subscriptions, we have an increase of 160,000, largely to accommodate the renewal of uh, Microsoft Office licenses, but also supporting a number of other new applications and a co corresponding uh, reduction in a number of applications as well. In our grants uh, line, again in category three, we have a continuing request for uh, 50,000 for our 2023 digital equity uh, grants funding. Uh, this uh, uh, was a, uh, a program originally established under the Rec Re uh, Recover Forward umbrella. It is now a regular part of the ITS uh, uh, general fund budget. 
And then for community access TV uh, and radio line, we have a decrease of 460,000 uh, where we've shifted from the general fund to ED lit uh, our uh, CATS expenses for this year. Moving on to general fund category four, we have a decrease of 940,000 due again to one-time expenses uh, for, uh, in this case, uh, network, uh, network hardware, virtual infrastructure, and more. In equipment, we have an increase of uh, 45,000 to replace uh, PEG hub, uh, our PEG hub system, PEG, PEG being public education and government channels. This is the hardware that pulls in the signal and programming from CATS and then distributes it to uh, various uh, service providers. That hardware is due to be uh, replaced uh, this year and we're uh, proposing to uh, to do that here. Now on to the telecom non-reverting fund. Uh, the overall telecom non-reverting fund budget is $450,123. The telecom fund is divided into two sub accounts, an infrastructure account and a services uh, account. In infrastructure, uh, category three, we have a purchase of equipment. Uh, this is an increase of uh, 10,500 to uh, support uh, the movement of some firewall uh, uh, support and security services moved uh, from the general fund into the telecom fund. Again, in telecommunications infrastructure, Category uh, four, we have a decrease of 154,968 uh, dollars. This uh, represents the movement of this, uh, our regular computer capital replacement funding from the uh, infrastructure account to the services, uh, services account where there uh, are greater remaining, uh, greater remaining funds. And here, switching over to telecom services, this represents the other side of the ledger there with the uh, capital replacement of laptops, computers, uh, docks, uh, power supplies, monitors, et cetera, shifting over to this account. In electronic map uh, generation and enhanced access funds, we are not proposing any uh, any budgeted amount this year, so they are budgeted at zero. Uh, in terms of our uh, recover forward and cares funds, again, uh, large expenses in 2022, we are not proposing any, uh, any budget appropriations there. They have gone to, to zero. And then in ED lit, as mentioned before, we are budgeting 465. Uh, thousand for IT uh, infrastructure, cybersecurity investments, and CAT support. In our digital equity fund, uh, we are uh, budgeting eighty-four thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine uh, dollars to support the uh, hiring of a digital equity specialist with uh, accompanying appropriations in category two and three for that fund to support. Uh, basic office equipment and other expenses to get, get them and their efforts off the ground. On this slide, you'll see the ITS budget broken down by category and uh, fund with 3,132,000 from general, 465,000 from ED lit, 85,000 from the digital equity fund and 415,000 from the telecom fund. And then in this slide, we have the proposed ITS budget for 2023, uh, as well as recent budget years for comparison. The overall proposed 2023 ITS budget is $4,097,611, which is a decrease of $1,397,489. And 
Thank you for your consideration of the 2023 ITS budget. We look forward to helping city staff meet their goals and potential with technology tools and support in 2023. And we appreciate the honor and opportunity to serve our sister city departments as well as the Bloomington community. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Dietz. Go on to Council, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you for the presentation, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Dietz. Um, since the uh, main funding for community access television switched from the general fund to ED Lit, it was a little bit hard to compare with last year. Uh, can you tell me, has it increased, decreased? What's the overall support level for CATS? Uh, um, you know, for CATS, the, it's a 1% it's a uh, increase. 1% increase yeah. overall? Yeah. And does that keep up with the increase in their costs for employees and equipment and all that? That, that keeps up with the funding model that we have you know, used for the past several years. Uh, you know, in terms of their, you know, their general uh, request, they've, they've been fairly flexible and they've been working to reduce their overall costs. Um, as you may recall, this is a jointly, uh, jointly funded project with the city, uh, Monroe County, and the town of Ellettsville uh, providing uh, financial support for this program as well as the, the uh, Monroe County uh, Public Library. And over the past you know, several years, this has been uh, the, the funding model we've adopted. So uh, how does it work? It's a multi-year agreement, or they ask you each year for a certain amount, or how does uh, that Yeah, they, they, um, you know, they usually will send, send us you know, a letter describing, you know, describing their needs. You know, we'll consider that and make, uh, make a proposal uh, about that. And, the, and this year, um, uh, and they could speak to this more, Concretely, I know that they've uh, reduced some, you know, headcount. They've engaged in a number of efficiency uh, practices, so we feel that this, you know, budgeted amount is adequate for their needs. Okay, I'm just a little surprised because of inflation, and so the cost of mm -hmm. keeping good employees is certainly way higher than one percent. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that they did not request a, a bigger mm -hmm. increase. No. Okay. Yeah, as, as you, you may recall, um, you, you've seen um, uh, Michael White here as well as Martin O'Neill. Uh, when when uh, Mr. White you know, retired, they did not, or they filled that position with Mr. O'Neill and they did not hire you know, a replacement. So they, I think they felt that they were able to reduce their, uh, you know, their uh, management, their leadership uh, headcount, you know, without adverse effects. So, you know, we didn't, we took that and, and didn't think that they necessarily, you know, were seeking a, a, a substantial increase, you know, based on that. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rello. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dietz, for your presentation. Uh, has Meridian contracted with an uh, internet service provider uh, yet? And if so, wh who is that? What is that entity? Um, um, so yes, yes, and no. My understanding from a conversation today with uh, their leadership is that all of the remaining issues have been you know, resolved at the board level, and so they intend to sign a contract you know, within you know, a few days. You know, at that point you know, we would be happy to announce uh, okay. the, so the ISP. It, it's forthcoming very soon, it sounds like. Yes. And I had another quick question, may I? Yes. Um, well, this is, uh, it was an interesting anecdote that my colleague, uh, Councilmember Flaherty, brought up about geofencing. And mm -hmm. I would assume that if that were um, something we would pursue, your, your department would be deployed to do that. Um, is that something that would be feasible? Uh, are you, you know, may have an infrastructure that is superior in some ways to ours in terms of providing, uh, you know, places where these, where the scooters would be or where they wouldn't be, but mm -hmm. clearly they're blocking sidewalks. Is geofencing feasible? This is something we could pursue? It, it, it is feasible and it is, it's done. It's done with the scooter 
uh, scooter hardware or scooter vendors technology platform. Uh, it's not something that we, you know, we don't create geofences. What we have done uh, and, and can do, you know, even more is provide the, you know, through our GIS team, the, you know, coordinates and the, you know, the, the spatial information that would define, you know, where things are geofenced, but it, it is up to the vendor uh, to be able to, you know, to utilize that, you know, information. I see. So this is something then you could provide the data, you could provide the information, mm -hmm. but it's up to us to have as sort of a legal, something legally binding uh, for that vendor uh, to develop this and mm -hmm and uh, adhere to it, right? My assumption would be that most, if not all, of the existing uh, vendors have this capability. I can't speak to the contract because it's been years since I've, you know, I've looked at it. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions from council members? Okay, seeing none, we will go to the public for public comment. Thank you, Mr. Dietz. Um, I will remind those in the public, if you have a comment over Zoom, please use the raised hand function in Zoom, or you can use the mobile, or if you're on a mobile device, use star nine to reach us. And if none of those work, you can contact the meeting host on the chat function on Zoom. Um, Mr. Lucas, do we have any takers? Not that I see right off the bat, no. Okay, thank you. Give it just a second, and we'll seek those here in the public. If we have any public comments from anyone present, seeing none, none on Zoom. Okay, we'll return to council for any final comments um, before seeking a due pass recommendation. Councilmember Rallo. Thank you. Um, well, uh, I realize this the, the uh, digital equity. Um, employee that you propose, uh, which is half an FTE. Uh, you know, I, I, I support the idea, um, but uh, because I'm trying to remain consistent here in terms of evaluating whether or not new employees should be added at a time when we should have adequate compensation, I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll be passing this evening, but overall, uh, I, I think your, your department has been doing a fine job, and I appreciate uh, your work. Thank you. Thank you. Any further final comments from council? Seeing none, I'm sorry, Council Member Volan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to echo Council Rallo's sentiments um, and to say that uh, I appreciate the efforts ITS has made to uh, upgrade the council chambers. You can see it in several pieces of technology, uh, such as the control panel in front of uh, you, Mr. Chair, and, and other upgrades, um, and that uh, in general, the evolution of the department, especially in light of the um, fading telecom fund, uh, is, it, it seems to be appropriate and uh, it's interesting to follow. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay, before we go forward, um, I will say uh, thank you for the presentation, Mr. Dietz, and I too want to tag along with Council Member Volan. Um, we've had some challenges in the last couple of years, and particularly in the ITS infrastructure and how we do business here within the city. And I want to thank you for your patience and your expertise, um, and even holding your temper sometimes. I know <laughs> we, we have some good times, but I appreciate the progress that's been made and look forward to more progress as we move forward. So, seeing no more comments, I believe we're ready for a due process recommendation. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Council Member Sanford? Yes. Rollo? Pass. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenberger? Pass. Volan? Yes. Sims? Yes. And Skimbalary. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And that is 703. I'm sorry, 2. Thank you. 
702. Now we will now go towards City Council and Mr. Lucas, are you ready? Yes, thank you, council members. Uh, good evening, my name is Stephen Lucas. I am the council administrator and attorney, and it's my pleasure tonight to present the 2023 proposed budget for the uh, Bloomington Common Council office. The Bloomington Common Council is the legislative body for the city of Bloomington. Uh, the council exercises its legislative powers through action in public meetings, such as the one tonight, uh, to adopt ordinances, resolutions, orders, and motions for the government of the city and the control of the city's property and finances. The council strives to perform these functions in an open, effective, and deliberative manner. The council is made up of nine elected members from Bloomington, that is you all. Uh, three at-large members represent the city as a whole, while six members represent specific geographic districts within the city. The council staff includes three regular staff members as well as an O'Neill Service Corps fellow and this year we're happy to be hosting an undergrad, a Cox Civic Scholar for the first time. In addition to meeting as a full council, uh, as you are tonight, the council utilizes several different standing committees to divide up its work. Uh, currently, the council util uh, utilizes a Climate Action and Resilience Committee, a sidewalk committee, a Jack Hopkins Social Services Committee, and I'll mention that the council also sends uh, representatives from this body to serve on dozens of other governing bodies throughout uh, both city and county governments. I've listed a few here on the slide as an example. So I'll be running through some 2022 budget goal updates and some highlights uh, over the past year. Uh, one of the primary activities of the council is to uh, consider and adopt legislation. Uh, the council has acted on several significant items of legislation recently. Uh, Corporation uh, Council Beth Kate mentioned a few that I'll also note here. Uh, the council recently considered and adopted annexation proposals that uh, if uh, once they take effect would expand the city's boundaries for the first time in over a decade. Uh, the council also considered and supported an increase to the local income tax to support economic and sustainable development for Bloomington. Revenues generated by this tax are meant to support public safety, climate change preparedness uh, and mitigation, as well as equity and quality of life improvements, uh, while also supporting essential city services. Uh, in conjunction with this lit increase, the council also approved the uh, issuance of general obligation bonds uh, to support projects addressing climate change preparedness and implementing uh, additional equity and quality of life improvements for city residents. I'll also mention a few months ago, this council approved a historic four-year collective bargaining agreement negotiated uh, with uh, the FOP team and the city negotiating team uh, to support retention and competitive recruiting efforts within the uh, city's police department. And while not an item of legislation, uh, Councilmember Rosenbarger mentioned this earlier, uh, the council and city have also prioritized diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts over the past year by making specific DEI training available to elected officials and department heads uh, throughout the city. And just to give you a sense of the legislative uh, activity over the last few years, I've got some figures here on the number of items of legislation adopted through, uh, from 2020 through August of 2022. I'll mention that many of these legislative efforts uh, and operations uh, during, the years, during these years were influenced by the COVID-19 uh, public health emergency. Uh, when that statewide public health emergency ended in March of this year, the council's operations uh, began to shift back to uh, normal. However, the council and many other governing bodies throughout the city uh, have continued to operate uh, in a hybrid meeting fashion like uh, the one we've got going tonight. Uh, where members of both council, city staff, and the public can observe and often participate in the meeting remotely in an effort to increase accessibility of government uh, to all. Uh, in this vein, an ongoing goal that you'll see later uh, moving forward for the council office will be a, a further collaboration with uh, departments here in the city, especially the clerk's office and ITS department, to examine and continue implementing appropriate accessibility improvements uh, through workflow and process changes and technology improvements. Under the activity of policy development and coordination, um, 
I'll just note that the council, uh, to do all this legislative work, the council employs uh, staff members who, among other duties, uh, engage in policy development and coordination uh, with both members, other city departments, and members of the public. Council staff will continue to collaborate with these stakeholders to develop legislation and prepare it for council action. Uh, I'll note recently the council staff has completely turned over uh, since this time last year. We're excited to welcome two uh, new regular employees and I mentioned our two new office interns. And one immediate goal for the upcoming future is to onboard and train these new staff members to return the office to full capacity uh, so it can support the work that you all do. I'll, I'll mention here the council staff has also taken on the role uh, in the last year of providing coordination and administ administrative support uh, for both the Community Advisory on Public Safety Commission, uh, which met for the first time in May of 2021, and the ongoing redistricting commission, uh, which is set to wrap up its work in the uh, coming week, hopefully. Another major activity of the council is making decisions regarding certain discretionary funding uh, that's available for specific purposes. These efforts include the work of the council's Jack Hopkins Committee and Sidewalk Committee. In 2021 and 2022, the Jack Hopkins Committee awarded uh, roughly $850,000 to several dozen, uh, to dozens of different social service agencies in the Bloomington community. Uh, last year, the Council's Transportation Committee, as it was then named, uh, made recommendations for the use of $336,000 out of the Alternative Transportation Fund to help pay for construction or design of new sidewalks, as well as certain traffic calming or pedestrian improvement projects. Uh, for years, a major goal of this committee, uh, now, now uh, returning to the name of the Sidewalk Committee, uh, was to revise the objective criteria used to rank and consider uh, sidewalk projects, Last year, uh, with much help from city staff in planning and transportation, uh, the committee overhauled both the objective criteria uh, and the list of potential projects uh, that the committee draws from. Uh, this represents the largest update to this methodology and, and process since the creation of the committee in 1992. Uh, finally, just a quick note, each year, uh, four council members from this body participate on the Public Safety Local Income Tax Committee of the Monroe County Local Income Tax Council which involves collaboration with uh, representatives from Monroe County, Ellettsville, and Steinsville on allocations for uh, public, serv uh, public safety expenditures. More information about all of these committees is available on the Council's website. Finally, under 2022 activities, I'll just mention that uh, through the end of last year and, and into the start of this year, Council staff worked primarily remotely. Uh, while continuing to respond and assist with constituent concerns and contacts, whether through phone calls, emails, or, or other interactions. Uh, staff receive hundreds of constituent contacts each year, uh, and that doesn't count the various interactions that you all have with the public uh, on a weekly or, or daily basis. Uh, I'll mention here, too, that many of you hold regular constituent meetings where you invite members of the community to uh, speak to you on any matter of, of general concern. Moving into some of our 2023 budget goals and activities. Uh, I'll just mention first under legislative duties that the specific items of legislation taken up in a given year uh, often depend on what's happening uh, in the city uh, more broadly. Uh, this is reflected uh, by the legislation brought by the administration and the legislation that you all uh, sponsor on your own. Uh, this can often be difficult to predict in advance. Uh, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, council and our staff will continue to um, uh, assist with developing legislation and um, will look to improve public access to the activities of the council, uh, again, through uh, further improvements made to hybrid meetings, um, integrated technology options. I'll mention you can't see it on the screen, but uh, tonight uh, there's a live transcript of the meeting available to the public. Um, one budget item I'd like to draw attention to now is under our other services and charges line in our category three. Uh, for several years, the council office has budgeted for ASL interpreting services in that line, uh, but these services have been suspended, uh, or were suspended at the beginning of the pandemic and have not uh, been picked back up. Uh, that money uh, remains in the council budget and my intent, should it 
be there through uh, once the budget is approved would be to advertise that ASL or other interpreting services are available upon request uh, rather, a rather than a regular feature at council meetings. Um, and that funding could also be used for other accessibility improvements that come to light as we refine our hybrid meeting setup. Um, I'll say several uh, suggestions have been made over the course of the last few months and that money could be used toward uh, additional accessibility improvements. Uh, under the goal of, uh, under the activity of policy development and coordination, uh, staff will continue to work with council members, uh, the administration, the public, and various committees to develop policy and best practices. Uh, I, I mentioned that an immediate goal under this activity is to train new staff members to increase council office capacity uh, for assisting council members with your legislative initiatives. Uh, under discretionary funding in 2023, um, an ongoing goal is to uh, continue to make improvements to this, uh, to committee application and review processes. Uh, Jack Hopkins committee, for example, has an annual survey it sends to uh, all applicants to solicit feedback and suggestions, which the committee always takes seriously uh, each year when it sets up uh, the next year's funding cycle. Uh, for the sidewalk committee, uh, the goal is to build on the recent overhaul I mentioned to the criteria and project list uh, in order to continue examining ways the committee can make informed, fair decisions on the allocation of resources toward uh, sidewalk construction. Uh, next year, the council office will continue uh, to strive, uh, con continue striving to provide timely responses to constituent contacts uh, in whatever form those contacts take. Uh, council office staff has now uh, returned to uh, working primarily from City Hall, uh, so we look forward to working more directly with the public uh, in the upcoming uh, months and year. Finally, I'll just mention council uh, staff includes two attorneys who strive to represent and perform work on behalf of the council, and uh, the goal we have under this activity is to attend at least 12 hours of uh, training throughout the year not only to uh, ensure compliance with uh, CLE requirements, continuing legal education requirements, but also to stay informed of emerging issues and changes in law that affect the council. Uh, to the numbers, uh, the main increase you will see in the budget is in category one, where there's a requested increase of uh, $15,625. Uh, this represents a 5% increase in salaries for both uh, council members and uh, council office staff. I'll have to rely on Mr. Underwood as to why our category one overall uh, increase is 2.63%. Uh, category two, you'll see a small increase uh, in dollar amount, uh, $578, uh, representing a 14% increase. Uh, this is to buy some new office chairs. Category three, um, there's an, a requested increase of just over $6,000. This is primarily in the Jack Hopkins uh, Fund, uh, where you'll see a $6,000 increase requested for that program funding. Uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, this is uh, not a change in the budget, uh, but I did wanna highlight that the funding that we've uh, budgeted each of the last several years for ASL uh, remains in the council office budget. Uh, again, my intent, should that money uh, be left there, would be to advertise those services as available upon request with sufficient notice uh, and then use, uh, track how much of that funding is, is being used for translation services and then uh, come to the council and report back on any uh, additional expenditures for accessibility improvements that are requested. One other uh, non-change I'd like to highlight, and again, I may have to lean on the controller's office for some help here. Uh, the requested category four budget, uh, which is entirely uh, funding toward the council sidewalk committee process uh, is $336,000. Uh, this represents no change over last year's budget. As I understand it, the funding sources that flow into the alternative transportation fund where this money comes from uh, will not support an increase uh, for next year. This slide shows each category request by fund. There are three funds that, that uh, make up the council office budget. The total request is 1,362,665, which is uh, roughly a 2% increase over last year's budget.
And that is the presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. I never get tired of hearing about you and what we do. Um, <laughs> we'll now go, <laughs> go to our council members for comments. Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, questions, I apologize. Yes, um, can I assume that the grant line and other services and charges for $55,000, does that still uh, represent the um, support for the Buskirk Chumley Theater? That does, yes, there's no change to that, that line. Uh, Yes, $55,000 is the amount budgeted for uh, the Buskirk Chumley grant. Thank you. Okay, thank you, I'm sorry. Council Member Rallo. Thank you, Chair Sims. Uh, maybe this question is better uh, directed to a city controller, Underwood. Um, hello, Mr. Underwood. Um, yeah, my question is about the, uh, we have a very meager sidewalk fund and the fact that it's not increasing, uh, even though the cost of materials and labor and so forth is surely increasing, meaning we're going to have fewer yards or meters of sidewalk in the next year. Um, could, you, could you maybe describe a little bit more about the alternative transportation fund and why it's inadequate that we get an increase? Yeah, uh, that, that fund uh, primarily gets uh, from um, parking uh, services in, in that area. Uh, we've seen a decrease. We've Having trouble hearing you, sorry. All right, I'll get a little closer and speak a little louder. Uh, that fund uh, has, uh, is recovering from the pandemic, uh, from parking services, um, fees and fines and permits. Uh, and it's just not co completely recovered. So uh, it was very difficult to get that budget to pass, uh, to balance uh, with the available funding. Uh, and we wanted to go ahead and make sure that the personnel request uh, the funding for the increases in that department were funded. Uh, so it was just, uh, an, we didn't have the opportunity to increase um, even $3,000 for the sidewalk. I will say there is significant other capital investments that you'll hear about uh, later this week. So I think we've made, probably have funds uh, that would be more than what we would have been able to increase. This is typically about a $3,000 increase um, per year and we just couldn't make it work in this particular case, but we have found other funding arrangements that I think we'll be able to incorporate uh, sidewalk work in that would more than, um, account for the 3,000 in this fund. Are, are there other funds that we could transfer to this to, to, to build our-, not, our at this time, not at this time. We, we like I said, I, I think you'll see that we have increased the funding uh, more than what we would have been able to in this particular fund for sidewalks. Okay, we, we, maybe we, we'll discuss this further, thanks. Yeah, I think you'll see that when, um, Andrew, uh, see the um, engineering budget. Okay, thank you. Any further questions from council members? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to the public. Um, I will remind the folks that are on Zoom that if you wish to make a public comment, please use the raised hand function on Zoom. Uh, if you're on a mobile device, you can reach us through star nine. And if neither of those work, you can please send a note to the meeting host via chat, uh, the chat function on Zoom. Do we have anyone on Zoom waiting? At this time, I see no one raising their hand right now. Thank Chair you. Sims, yes. I have been contacted by a member of the public who would like to speak. That individual is Sam Dove. Um, yes, he has three, I'm sorry, two minutes. Are you there, Mr. Duff? If I'm not mistaken, I think Mr. Duff normally sends us notes in chat. Um, are you there, Sam? I'm sorry, Mr. Duff. Yeah. 
Okay, if you could send that to us in chat or an email to our office, we'll make sure that all of our council members get that information. Okay, and any more public? Thank you, Clerk McDowell. I do believe that I have the message now. Um, the message is, why does general have zero? Why does general have zero? Yes, I believe that's, yeah, why general have zero in budget? Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, now we'll go to public comment to anyone present. If we have anyone, and seeing none, we'll go back to council for final comments. Seeing none from council, uh, I'm sorry, council member Piedmont Smith. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand what Mr. Dove was saying. I, there is a zero in category four of the general fund, which is capital expenditures, because we have none in our general fund budget. So maybe that's what he was referring to. Um, I'm not sure. I, I also want to take this opportunity to uh, welcome the deputy attorney administrator, Ash Kulak to um, council office. Uh, I believe it's their first meeting, so welcome tonight. And uh, Mr. Lucas, as, as always, thank you for preparing the presentation and the budget. Thank you. Okay, any further council comments? Um, again, Mr. Lucas, thank you for the presentation. And, and as well, I'd like to say welcome. Um, I was over talking to you and never even said that, so I do apologize. And we do have, um, We've had a, turn, a little bit of staff uh, turnover, for lack of a better term. And um, I really appreciate the dedication and the hard work that you have shown us, or me, and all of our colleagues, and keeping this train on the rail, so to speak. So um, we really appreciate that. And seeing any more comments, I do believe we're ready for a, a due pass recommendation. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? I'm, before we do that, did I miss Council Member Volan? No. Okay, just, okay, thank you. All right, Council Member Rollo. Yes. Flaherty? No. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenbarger? Pass. Volan? Yes. Sims? Yes. Scambolari? Yes. And Sandberg. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's 711. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Okay. I don't know who's next. It looks my computer. Okay. Now we'll move to the controller's office. Um, everyone's fighting each other to get to the podium, so we'll try to accommodate you. Um, we're ready for your presentation if you are. Good evening, City Council members. My name is Cheryl Gilliland. I am the uh, Director of Auditing. Tonight, my colleague uh, Jeff McMillan and I will be presenting the 2023 uh, controller's budget. The state legislature established the position of controller and laid out the related duties for the city of Bloomington the controller and his staff provide the city's 22 departments with additional fiscal oversight in addition the staff interacts with a number of other departments such as the Bloomington Housing Authority Bloomington Transit um, and the uh, Bloomington Urban Economic Association as a few item, few uh, departments. The controller serves as the city's chief financial officer. The controller's office comprises of 11 staff members and two interns. We are, rep we, um, are responsible for um, a variety of um, areas, um, one of those being um, the annual budget, the submission of which uh, we are doing this week. Um, reporting at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, managing the 
fire and police pensions, uh, plus a number of uh, financial oversights for major initiatives such as uh, uh, Switchyard Park um, and the current and new hospital sites. I'm Jeff McBellin, Deputy Controller. Uh, the core, the 2022 core departmental functions uh, that we have, or goals, is we increase the EFT, electronic funds transfer participation from 73 to 75%. So we're writing less checks. Uh, we ensure that all city deposits are made within one or the next business day. And we maximize the uh, rate of return of the city's funds. Okay, budgeting. Uh, we issue the announcements 10 days before the public hearing, and we make sure that the DLGF, DLGF is informed five days after council approval. Updates for the area of research and special projects. Um, the public safety local income tax, which is also known as PSLIT, is continuously monitored and reported. For this year, we have um, provided recommendations during the regular meetings with the dispatch, police, and fire. The controller's office collaborates closely with multiple departments to integrate software with the ERP system as this is an ongoing endeavor. Some of our projects have included utilizing the Geneva and Paris system for the parking garage revenue. Also the rec track system for parks. In the area of internal auditing, reaching the goal of obtaining an opinion on the 2021 financial statements from the State Board of Accounts, also known as the SBOA, has been delayed. Reaching this goal is, slow, is solely uh, controlled by the SBOA, um, and at this point, they are behind schedule. As of today, 16 of the 18 cash funds have been audited. The remaining two cash funds will be audited by the 1st of September, or the beginning of September, rather. Um, and as usual, um, all of our cash accounts have been in very good standing. Okay. 23 budget goals for the core department functions is to increase the electronic funds transfer uh, process or payment process to 77% and to establish a monthly training for new employees about purchase order processing and the process. Also a regrouping of commodity codes to um, determine an aggregate level of goods purchase which it could help in leveraging buying power and getting reduced cost. Okay, budgeting, uh, coordinate with the city departments to ensure the uh, documentation is complete and distributed prior to the budget hearings in August. Also issue the budget packet to council on the Friday before the hearings. For the areas of research and, oh, I lost my job. and special projects, um, the controller's office will continue um, to participate in the planning and usage of the remaining CARES and ARPA funds. We also have a goal to migrate our travel voucher form from being stored as a paper copy to being stored as an electronic version. Right now, the vouchers are saved electronically, but paper copies along with receipts are also printed. The State Board of Accounts must grant permission to replace the printing of the paper vouchers as our official documentation. In 2023, the Controller's Office has a goal to um, continue supporting um, the potential convention center expansion, 
the Trades District Tech Center, John Walden Arts Center, as well as Hopewell. For the area of internal auditing, in 2023, by quarter two, it is our, uh, our goal to obtain the 2022 financial statements from the State Board of Accounts without any major findings. The auditing of cash funds will continue in 2023, with the ongoing accounts being audited twice a year and the seasonal accounts being audited once a year. Our highlights for the 2023 budget. Our overall request is 3.1 million, which reflects a $987,000 increase from 2022. This increase basically occurs in two categories. Category one request is $1.2 million. This increase will cover the 5% cost of living increase which aligns with the city's citywide proposal. In addition, the budget will cover the cost of a new grant research and sourcing manager position that will be placed in our office. The category three request is 1.9 million. Uh, this is an increase of $844,000, which will um, cover new and existing research in initiatives um, that are identified within EdLit. Um, and will be covered by with those funds. As you can see from our summary, um, the light blue column is our 3.1 million um, spread out across the four different categories, with categories two and four with no incre with uh, no change from 2022. Our funding comes from five areas. As you can see, general fund, ARPA, CARES, EDLIT, and the non-reverting -rever improvement fund. Oops, actually, I'm gonna go back here for, to this slide for one second. Um, the controller's general operating request is 3.1 million. Um, but as usual, uh, the controller's office also administers um, a number of other funds, which total $11.2 million. And those funding sources include um, debt services, the police fire pension fund, uh, board of public safety, uh, food and beverage tax, as well as the vehicle replacement. If you add the controller's general operating budget of 3.1 million with these additional funding sources, the total budget is 14.3 million. So in summary, the 2023 controller's budget increases align with the stated goals presented this evening. And we thank you very much for your consideration of the Controller's Office 2023 proposed budget. And Jeff and I are available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for the <coughs> tag team presentation. Uh, we'll go to our council members. Um, council Member Volan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to both of you for uh, an interesting presentation. Um, uh, can you, I'm, I'm trying to find the slide uh, uh, where you talked about um, the increase in category three. Um, can you break that down a little bit? Uh, what's already being done with category three and uh, the other service and, and why the, uh, the large increase? I know that this is a, a lot to do with um, various new uh, funding streams that have come uh, available, but um, can you break down the increase uh, a little bit more? I'll, uh, I'll jump in there, if you don't mind, Jeff Underwood, City Controller, help my staff out a little bit. Um, as you can see on this, uh, the, the increases, there's $4,000 <coughs> in the ARPA fund, 
Uh, that's primarily for short-term project management that we would administer with other departments to help with all the very activities that we've got going on. That I figured, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the $250 in the CARES, uh, Caroline Shaw spoke to this. Uh, the way that the CARES fund is set up, and this is just inside baseball, is it falls under the controller's office. That is the amount that we've allocated for the compensation, classification, and, and career path study. So that's an increase there. Um, if the ED lit and the general fund budgets come together, and then the non-reverting uh, amount is a combination of two things. Uh, typically, we budget for out of that for our IAC dues, AIM dues. And in addition, uh, this is another one of those inside baseball because that fund is set up under the controller's office. There's $150,000 for outside legal services uh, that Beth Kate talked about earlier in um, her presentation. So that's that's the primary uh, changes to our budget. In addition, we have funds available for both uh, financial advisors uh, for various projects, whether it be annexation or special projects to do with Hopewell, um, the old okay. the site, so, and so okay. on. So it sounds like most of the increase is in relatively short-term funding, ARPA and CARES. How would you characterize in the last 40 seconds what uh, the long-term increases are most about? Uh, it would be the addition of the grants um, person, the research and um, a person that um, Cheryl talked Okay. About. Okay. And uh, finally, I see. Otherwise, it was pretty much a flat budget. Okay, and finally, I see you've moved all of the category one funding out of the general fund into the ED lit. Any thoughts on that? It's just the way that we we tried to simplify how we utilize the funds out of the ED lit because it's got to be spent directly out of that. is It's primarily four departments, but it's um, HR ourselves. Um, you heard uh, Rick Dietz talk about uh, their share, and then you'll hear uh, Thursday night public works uh, allocation from the okay uh, yeah thank you thank you thank you council member scambleri yes thank you thank you for the presentation um i think you sort of explained this but and i apologize if i'm being slow but i, I need you to walk me through it again um office of the controller budget by fund there are five different funds listed there um, as sources for your operating budget, correct? And on this Tableau report that we got, either, there are 14 different funds listed as, as, an, as sources of funding for your office. So discuss, I guess, is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, those 14 um, are condensed down to the ones that I mentioned, which is debt services, uh, police and fire pension, uh, Board of Public Safety, the food and beverage, the vehicle replacement, um, they're all condensed. That ends up being 11.2 million. Which brings um, you to the 14.34. Exactly, from okay. the address. Um, so if you administer, so if you, the controller's office, administer these funds, they appear only under yours. So for example, the parks bonds don't also appear under parks. They just appear under the controller's office, even though they may benefit parks-related projects. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is um, Councilmember Scandalari. This you is the debt. Get, you could get rid of the slide. Interest. Interest. I'm sorry. Go on, Mr. Underwood. Sorry. Uh, th this is just primarily the debt service uh, payments. So we're responsible for making those uh, semi-annual debt service payments for all the different bond funds of the city. So that's why they're listed under us, and we just basically make the payments. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I wanted to ask where does the non reverting improvement funds, where does that money come from? What is that? Uh, this, this will uh, spend the, the, most of the money that's left in that fund. This is the old, uh, in, uh, in lieu of annexation, West Side Fund. Uh, that came, originally was uh, started when we had uh, the major industries on the um, west side. So this spends the remainder of those funds out of there. Thank you. And then um, I may have missed it. The, uh, the big increase in category three 
what was it, 700, no, 975,111 in ED lit um, funds in category three. What is that gonna be used for? Uh, it's really broken down to uh, outside services for financial advisors. And it, th th there wasn't an increase, it was just a transfer from the general fund into the ED lit um, so that it made it simpler. The big increases were in ARPA for project management, 400,000, the $250,000 for the comp classification study, and $150,000 for outside legal services. So the, the ED lit 975,000 is not new expenditures? No, so, so no, it would have appeared at the general fund last year. So it mainly goes to, what did you say, consultants? Uh, project management is uh, part of it, and uh, financial advisors. So the project management, that's in-house, right? Or that's... It allows us to bring in uh, short-term uh, outside project management. So essentially, uh -huh. rather than adding long-term employees uh, for short-term projects, we do outside services for project management on big projects that have a, a one to three year time period. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. Uh, this was probably best directed to your presentation earlier this evening, Mr. Underwood, but I'm going to ask it now since you're here and it might help me with the rest of the budget process, which is uh, in reviewing the um, annual financial reports from, from last year and previous years to help me decipher where revenues go into what funds and, and how those flow, um, I was just looking up you know, vis-a-vis -vis your comment on the council budget about uh, the sidewalk, uh, sorry, alternative transportation fund. I noted like the last several years, there's been a $300,000 transfer in from another fund into that um, alternative transportation fund. And then, you know, there's this uh, disbursements as well as part of that uh, financial report, as you know, uh, and sometimes different funds note transfer out, transfer to another fund just like some note transfer in, transferred from another fund. Uh, from my initial review, I'm not seeing how to track that. So in particular, you know, for example, what was the fund the money came from for the transfer in to the um, uh, alternative transportation fund? And then similarly, when, when I see transfer out, transfer to another fund, uh, how, how am I able to tell where that went specifically? Is that discernible from the financial report? It is not discernible. It, 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 it can be, but there, because it, there's a lot of transactions, it's not necessarily easy to do. Um, I have uh, just finished up yet today uh, a, a, a exhibit for you that I'll be sending out tomorrow uh, that lists by funds and the major funding sources of that fund so you can see the revenue types that go into it. And that will include uh, a couple of funds where we transfer into, which this is one of those, where that comes from. And I believe in this case, it comes from our cum cumulative capital development fund, CCD. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And before we go to the next question, uh, Mr. Lucas, with the vehicle replacement pension, I'm sorry, police pension and fire pension, they're all part of this controller's presentation. So that's how we got, okay. Thank you, just wanna make sure I didn't lose anything past years that that may have been a separate vote on each item uh, if the controller's office is fine with just one one vote on the total controller's office budget that's, which I, I see a head nod uh, that's that's fine for tonight that's kind of what I'm getting at so um, council member Scambler. yes thank you and thank you in advance for your patience with my could you go over this again question um, 975 111 in category 3 is is being billed so to speak to ED lit correct Am I reading that yes. correctly? Okay. Yeah. What does that cover? Again? That uh, covers a trans, if you compared year over year, you would have seen this in the general fund. It's, the, it's a part of the allocation under the new ED lit. It's what we call commonly call the fourth bucket uh, that we presented. There were four buckets of spending in the ED lit. Um, and this represents that fourth bucket. It was easy. It's, for ease of, of monitoring and, and recording, we basically split the HR department between general fund and ED lit and 
our, our budget uh, between the general fund and the ED lit that represents that bucket, but it covers the costs that were talked about in there. So uh, it's not really any increase, it's just a transfer of our budget, will, our office will now be funded out of uh, two buckets, uh, the general fund bucket and the ED lit bucket. Okay, and and if I'm hearing you correctly, we can't, how do we tease out what is getting paid for with the lid increases, I guess what I'm trying to get at. I can provide you that information. We've talked about it some tonight uh, in the uh, cost of the raise, the 1%, I believe uh, uh, Councilmember Rallo asked us earlier, what was the cost of the 1%? Uh, what was, the, you know, we can give you the cost of all the HR stuff that we're doing as well as other increased costs and the fact that we were able to transfer uh, and support police and fire expenditures um, all fully out of uh, general fund and ED lit between the two of them. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any further questions from council? Okay, we'll now go to public comment. Um, once again, we'll say if you're up on Zoom and you wanna make a public comment, please use the raised hand function on Zoom. If you're on a mobile device, you can reach us by star 69. And if neither of those work, you can reach us through sending a note to the meeting host via the chat function on Zoom. Um, Mr. Lucas, you can check and see if we have anyone. I believe it's star nine for the folks uh, who may have dialed in. Did and I, I don't did I see say? many new folks who have joined us on Zoom, so no takers right now. Okay, did I say star nine? I did say that. Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing none, uh, Mr. Alexander, you have two minutes. Thank you, uh, my name is Greg Alexander. Um, I have a friend, he lives in Chile, and two or three years ago they had a series of mass protests that involved police crackdowns and everything, and he explained to me, this really blew my mind, in the middle of this emergency, the controller found that the police crackdown wasn't compatible with the legislation that authorized their budget, and the controller cut off funding to the police. Well, this isn't chilly, but I think we could learn something from their example. In 2018, Parks and Rec decided to ask for about 10 million in bond funding, and they determined that in order to borrow that money, the state law says you have to have a bunch of public process, and they didn't want to do that. So what they did, um, creative accounting, they avoided that by splitting the amount into three smaller bonds, and then all that public oversight was replaced just by going to this council. And was that legal? was illegal because the controller said it is. And I don't, I don't care, as long as the oversight's effective, but it wasn't. Parks borrowed $2 million to provide a bike and ped connection from the city, from the, the gridded street network to North High School. And they simply decided administratively not to do that, but they spent the $2 million. And again, that's, that's legal just because the controller said it is. Otherwise, it would have been illegal because that wasn't what we were promised with that money. Um, and Parks borrowed another million dollars to connect the Cascades Path to Griffey Lake. They explicitly told this body they wouldn't spend that money on the east side of Griffey, that they'd spend it on the west side. They said, we will not spend it on the east side. They spent it all on the east side. And is that legal? Because the controller says it is. I'm just looking for a little bit better in the future. Um, the controller doesn't have to permit inappropriate expenditures, and in fact has a duty to restrain errant city departments. Um, the oversight that other departments have over Parks and Rec is not a mere formality. It is an essential service for the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no further public comment, we'll now go to council for any final comments. Council Member Scambolari. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm gonna pass on this particular budget. I just wanna have, uh, not to suggest I, I have a negative perception of it, um, but I wanna better understand um, the 14 different funds and how they're reflected in the controller's offices, the, the, the work of the office of the controller. So I just wanna mention that. Thank you. Any further final comments from Council? Seeing none, I do believe we're ready. I'm sorry, Council, Mar Council Member Volan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm uh, again intrigued by Mr. Alexander's comments, although I think that uh, they really are uh, questions for the Parks Department. Um, but uh, I think that, uh, I, I'm not sure how uh, 
Indiana state law uh, defines controllers in the same way that uh, uh, the country of Chile might. Um, but he raises a good question that continues to be uh, insufficiently addressed. Uh, but on the merits of the, uh, the budget itself, uh, I mean, I still continue to have a qualm here and there with uh, the, the free movement of money between different departments. But I think in the end, it's more important to know that money from a certain fund was spent correctly than who necessarily spent the fund, even though I'm still not a fan, for example, of the council having uh, the sidewalk fund underneath it. Uh, but uh, having said that, I do want to um, express appreciation for the improvements to the, the budget itself. Um, the uh, fact that there are now three full years of actuals in each chart that we're seeing tonight. Um, and we're seeing the new chart that shows where money's come by fund. I think that's probably the single most significant uh, presentational innovation uh, tonight is that it's easy at a glance to see what are the sources of funds of each department. And that frankly, uh, a lot of departments have a lot of, uh, of, of a lot more sources than we might think at first glance. So those charts continue to be uh, useful and I am uh, looking forward to, to uh, scrutinizing the rest of them as we go through the budget process. So thanks to Mr. Underwood and his staff. Thank you. Have any more final comments from council? Okay, seeing none, I believe we're ready for due process recommendation. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Pass. Rosenbarger? Pass. Bolin? Yes. Sims? Yes. Scambellari? Pass. Sandburn? Yes. And Rallo? Pass. Thank you. Thank you. That was 504. And thank the controller team for the presentation. And now we will move to the office of the mayor. I believe we're welcoming the deputy mayor to his first official presentation this year. Budget. Second. Is this a second? This you were here second. last year? Really? It, it, no. it feels like forever for me, like I'm I've been here sorry. forever, but no, I'm just, gotcha. I'm just playing. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Um, Hi, I'm Deputy Mayor Don Griffin, and I'm pleased to be presenting to you the Office of the Mayor budget for 2023. This is my second budget process at the city, and as Thank before, you. I look forward to your feedback and suggestions. And it really has been a pleasure uh, working with all of you, uh, learning uh, a lot about you as people, and it's made it much, much easier uh, for me to take on a, a job like this and, um, and I've really enjoyed it. So thank you so much for being great partners. Um, the Office of the Mayor provides strategic direction and leadership to 16 departments and nearly 800 full-time employees, plus Bloomington Transit and the Bloomington Housing Authority. You'll hear budget proposals from each of these departments over the course of four nights this week as we have assembled this budget package of approximately $229 million, including City of Bloomington Utilities, Bloomington Transit, and Bloomington Housing Authority. That is entrusted to us by our residents and visitors. The mayor's office consists of eight full-time employees, one temporary part-time employee, and five student interns. Important roles of the office and staff include providing strategic direction for the city as an organization, communicating and engaging with the public on issues important to our community, and operating or creating a culture of innovation to improve the efficiency of the services we deliver to residents and visitors. We have a great team, and you can see some of them here this evening. This modest size and hardworking team is in charge of overseeing a growing and complex organization. 
The Office of the Mayor is currently pursuing several initiatives to continue on our path of becoming a better Bloomington for all Bloomingtonians. This includes a commitment to being a safe, just, and inclusive community where everyone belongs and can thrive. Addressing the climate emergency and building a sustainable, equitable economy with good jobs, affordable housing, and inspiring arts and public spaces, and an ambitious and innovative city government delivering cost-effective modern services and advancing quality of life every day for current and future generations. I'd like to share a few with you. To address the nationwide issue of affordable housing in our own backyard, we've implemented new strategies and initiatives in our last comprehensive plan and our latest unified development ordinance. New home ownership assistance programs, along with a commitment to the Heading Home Initiative. Since 2016, Bloomington has developed, added, or preserved 1,121 1, units of affordable housing. This is a 20-fold increase from the previous six years, including units for people experiencing homelessness, addiction, mental illness, or disability, as well as our growing workforce. To develop our local economy, we are investing in our community through new infrastructure projects like the Convention Center and an exciting open architecture broadband internet expansion. Developing the uh, uh, certified tech park and Hopewell site, employing new job creation incentives for small businesses and upskilling workers through public coding and life science courses. While we develop our economy, we understand that it cannot come at the expense of our environment, which is why we continue on the path of sustainability established in the city's first climate action plan. This includes solar power, trails as transportation corridors, innovative waste and wastewater systems, enhanced public transportation, and new 1.6 million annual funding for progress made possible by the recently passed LID. A commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion with a racial equity plan and two new resident-led task force to evaluate, report, and propose recommendations to address racism and discrimination in Bloomington, including the future of policing task force. The city has initiated an open data portal be clear, this is a one-stop place for an ever-growing assembly of useful data that is open and accessible. Our office has been ambitious in pursuing these projects. We are guided every step of the way by the community who are able to participate in many ways through public meetings, boards and commissions, and even directly to our office, which increases transparency and community engagement. Let's start with some updates on our 2022 goals. We continue to make transparency a priority, and in 2022, as in past years, we delivered a state of public safety report, and we keep working on publishing our regular budget goal updates to increase both transparency and accountability. The mayor and our deputy mayor conduct regular meetings on key areas of focus, including weekly meetings about homelessness, bi-weekly meetings about affordable housing, planning and transportation, and Hopewell. We also have monthly meetings about citywide projects, climate action, uh, public safety, and bi-monthly meetings about Sibling City and the Green Ribbon Panel. The Mayor's Office collaborates with other city departments on all major projects. A couple of projects we'll highlight are Hopewell and the Convention Center. The administration meets weekly on the hospital redevelopment project now titled Hopewell. Currently both, IU Health, uh, currently both IU Health and we are in the process of demolition on our respective sites in preparation for construction to begin once that demolition process is completed. And as we've discussed in recent conversations about the convention center, 
Meetings with county colleagues and relevant stakeholders are ongoing as we seek to move this project forward. Communications continue to be a crucial function of our office and communications demand increases as a function of tra traditional media changes and community expectations grow. Our communications director, Andrew Krebs, digital brand manager, Justin Crosley, and copyright specialist, Deidre Sheets, produce press releases, e-newsletters, videos, manage social media and website updates, news conferences, and Facebook Live sessions to keep the public informed and engaged with our work. They also help coordinate opportunities for the mayor to interact with the press in real time, such as press conferences, interviews, and public events. Our goal for the year was 30 such opportunities, but there have already been 72 opportunities for the mayor to interact with the press in real time, plus an additional 27 opportunities for the deputy mayor or the director of public engagement. Our public engagement efforts are led by the tireless Mary Catherine Carmichael, who wrote that, no, I'm teasing, who directs our effort to seek public input in many different ways, such as neighborhood meetings and pol POCO surveys. By both bringing information into City Hall and sharing it out, she is able to match issues with those best positioned to address them. We have some of the best town and gown relationships anywhere thanks to frequent and ongoing communications and collaborations with our friends at Indiana University. Our engagement with IU, IU Health, and Monroe County has proven to be invaluable as we navigate the COVID pandemic uh, with much lower average rates of infection than the rest of Indiana. Finally, our last 2022 budget goal, goals are centered around innovation Innovation helps departments increase organizational effectiveness, creates a culture of collaboration and innovation, and helps departments prepare for future needs. Many thanks to our innovation director, Dave Ta Kidd, for always looking for ways to make our city progress and processes more efficient. As part of our culture of innovation, Dave Ta highlights success stories of department innovation on our website. Seven have been completed so far this year and showcases uh, these innovations in an annual innovation at work celebration, which was held in April. The innovation team extends beyond Davta, however, as she leads an annual innovation training cohort. This year's cohort is focused on innovating sidewalk maintenance and includes representatives from nine departments. The cohort meets regularly on the topic and will focus on it for the entire year. Speaking of entire years, each year is filled with robust reflection and thoughtful future planning. So let's turn to next year and what we are looking forward to in 2023. Of the 70 budget goals in the mayor's office for 2023, 26 are in the category of policy and administration. The goals include overseeing city operations, communication and collaboration with all parts of city government, and working with other local government entities. This includes coordination with council on scheduling leg legislation, meeting with county government leadership, and if it's deemed feasible, pursuing the purchase of CFC showers for our police station and fire department administrative offices. It also includes oversight and collaboration on several major projects and initiatives, including progress on the Climate Action Plan and continuing to pursue the potential expansion of the Convention Center. For the Green Ribbon, Ribbon Panel and the DEI initiative that we, we, we were first introduced in 2022, State of the City, the goal is to have two public events for each by Q4 2023, in addition to ongoing outreach on these initiatives. 13 of the, major, the mayor's of, uh, office budget goals relate to communications and are overseen by Andrew Krebs. As traditional media continues to change, our communications must also evolve to reach our residents. 
These include goals related to press releases, public events, guest columns, and other external communications, such as website improvements and launching a citywide resident communication platform by text and email. In June of this year, Andrew started an interdepartmental communications team, which meets biweekly with the purpose of standardizing and improving city branding, messaging, and communications, including social media training. These efforts will continue into 2023. Mary Catherine Carmichael oversees 17 of the mayor's official budget goals for 2023. These public engagement goals dovetail with many of the communications goals and include items such as conducting the fourth biannual community survey, outreach and collaboration with community partners, and work related to boards and commission appointments. The 14 other mayor mayor's office budget goals will be implemented by Dave to Kid. The innovation goals are focused on expanding the impact of innovation training and the culture of innovation at the city. We are also revamping the innovation fund, which will allow us to leverage funds to achieve savings and increase efficiencies across city operations. The innovation fund will be paid for through reversions with any funds allocated in 2023. The Office of the Mayor's general fund budget request is $1,084,530. This is an overall increase of $58,003, or 6% from 2022. A few highlights include, in category one, personal service request of $962,490. This is an increase of $58,000, three dollars or six percent from 2022 and this is due to salaries and wages um, our regular employees uh, will have an overall five percent increase in wages and related benefits and a one thousand dollar annual bonus for non-union employees salary and wages for temporary employee employees uh, uh, this reflects increase of 26 thousand dollars to fund the copyright specialist. This summary chart shows an overall view, an overview of the mayor's office budget from 2019 to 2023. The office of the mayor provides strategic direction and leadership to our 16 departments and nearly 800 full-time employees, including collaboration with Bloomington Transit, and the Bloomington Housing Authority. We trust our Office of the Mayor budget request aligns with our major initiatives of public safety, equity, civility and justice, affordable housing, economic development, climate change and sustainability, transparency and engagement, asset management and investment, innovation and diversity, equality and inclusion. Thank you for your consideration of the Office of the Mayor 2023 budget request. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Griffin. And I do apologize for misspeaking on your tenure. You're fine. Hey, I know. We've There's a got, lot going on tonight. Uh, and it's not over yet. <laughs> okay, we will now go to council for any council questions for Office of the Mayor's budget. Okay. Council Member Volan. No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wonder if uh, Dave Takid is in the room to uh, discuss the idea behind the innovation training cohort. Uh, she is not. Um, okay. Well, uh, can you at least discuss sort of the Sorry, go ahead. No, but if you have any questions, I can, I can relay them to, I can try to, to answer some of it and, uh, and we'll, we'll just uh, have her write it back to you as well, write the answer back to you. Okay, well, it's a general question, uh, just sort of um, uh, how have the first two, uh, how the first two co co cohorts panned out? Um, I, you know, how is this third one, uh, 
uh, doing. Like I, I just sort of wanted to understand uh, uh, some of the outcomes of those cohorts. Okay, that is a Dave to question. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I feel right, well, it's going well you. from our meetings, but uh, yeah, she could she could elaborate a lot more. I know she's very excited about this team that she has. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions from council? Council Member Rosenbarger and then Council Member. Thanks and thank you for that presentation. Senator. I also just wanted to ask a question about the innovation fund. So what you're saying is that's brand new, is that right? I, I, think, uh, I think it started, the position started with, uh, with a fund at one time, a small fund, and I don't think it's, it's ever, uh, we've ever gone back to it. Uh, but the, the hope is that with savings that she's helping create in other departments that we'll be able to, she'll be able to fund her, you know, her new projects through that. Okay, yeah, that sounds great, thank you. Oh, Dave's a... I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been trying to, uh, I've been trying to unmute. I wasn't initially made the co-host. I really appreciate the, the questions about innovation. To answer Steve's question about how are the cohorts going. So we're in our third cohort. The, the first one, was um, to explore the possibility of doing leaf management differently. And we piloted with just 22 households. The second cohort expanded that to 493 households. And the result of those cohorts is that we have um, 11 employees in a number of different departments throughout the city who now understand the design thinking, the human-centered design thinking framework and are able to introduce their own projects. Um, in addition to, as the mayor mentioned before, we are taking the bold step of, in 2023, discontinuing the uh, leaf vacuuming service because we've demonstrated through two different pilot programs that it's possible if we provide residents with the necessary training and support for mulching and composting that um, it's possible and, and supplement that with the yard waste pickup that we can, we can do away with the vacuum yard waste collection. Um, in addition, you may have heard and, and um, Mr. Zodi may expand on this when he's presenting the housing and neighborhood development budget that Angela Van Roy, who was one of the first cohort members, is embarking on a really ambitious project to explore how to bridge that gap between when an IU student is living in a dorm and then when they transition to living in neighborhood. And how do we decrease the amount of citations that they're given and also the um, amount of effort that's put into answering uh, what the what BPD calls nuisance complaints um, of noise or trash or parking in incorrect places and also just the general um, conviviality of a neighborhood and the cohesion of a neighborhood. So we've got uh, spinoff projects like Angela's and um, we're, th this is a, a major component to establishing a, um, a culture of innovation. <clears throat> to um, a Council Member Rosenbarger's question about the innovation fund, this is something that um, was initially started with my predecessor and um, there, uh, what, we, what we lacked back then was just structure around what is in scope for the fund, what's out of scope for the fund, how, what is the fund going to be focused on, how are we going to involve the other departments, how are we going to involve residents, and um, we believe that we've got a better way of doing that and we're starting small. Um, the initial fund, I think, was 100000 and then decreased to 50000 in the second year that it was offered. And this year, we're starting with just thirty five k or a request of thirty five k. 
Thank you. And Councilmember Sandberg. Thank you. I have several questions. Most I'll probably submit in writing, but here are two I'd like to get out quickly. The first one has to do with the affordable housing. The 1,121 units, I'd like to see a breakdown of where those are and maybe even some unit costs. If we could get some specifics about uh, developments that were produced that are now being counted as these affordable housing units. And are they affordable or are they workforce? You know, the distinguishing as to uh, the cost of some of those units I think would be helpful. And also, uh, kind of a general um, idea of where the housing development fund dollars have gone uh, in the past year. I think that would be very uh, helpful. Uh, my last question has to do with the purchase of the um, uh, CFC side of the Showers building. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's worded in, in a lot of places here, if feasible. Mm -hmm. This will be something that we pursue. My question has to do with what's being done to assess the feasibility, and um, is this a done deal? I mean, it almost sounds like it's being trotted out as, yeah, we're going to do this, and I, I just want to know, for the sake of both the police and the fire, who we all mm -hmm. know have undergone severe um, mm -hmm. stresses due sure. to the flooding of both, sure. both areas, we need a new... Uh, place for both of these operations to be, mm -hmm. but is this the absolute best we have? I really want to know more about the feasibility study okay. and, and what's going into that, and are we taking the due diligence to make sure that's the best use of these ED lit dollars? Okay. Thank you. Do you want me to answer a little bit of that now? If you can now, but again, I'm Okay, in regards to the shower complex, very simple. You put in an offer to purchase on something, you, you, you first negotiate you know, price, but you also make it contingent upon several things uh, with a timeline of what is the structure like. Um, and and in, this, in this situation, it's not just structure, it's, it's mechanicals, it's um, feasibility based on can it be converted? Um, is it how much is it going to cost to convert? Uh, that kind of thing. And so we are doing that kind of work right now. Um, and we're going in into it as, um, you know, I, I, it's not a done deal. It's not a done deal. It's contingent up on these things working. If they don't work, then we don't do it. Thank you, and I appreciate that. And so then the next question would be, what other locations are you possibly looking at if this is not feasible? So um, that might be helpful, too. There, there, and there are other places Thank that we are. That, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rallo. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, Deputy Mayor Griffin. I, I, I'm going to bring this up to you because I guess the buck stops at your office. Um, and that has to do with what was discussed a little bit earlier this evening, and that is um, some of us on the council are, are frustrated by the scooter uh, lack of enforcement of, of scooters in the, in the community. We've heard a lot from uh, our constituents about this. Uh, it's particularly acute uh, with, you know, regarding people with disabilities uh, mm -hmm. to find scooters blocking sidewalks. And uh, it seems that there isn't, hasn't been any enforcement. And um, I'm sure your office must be aware of this. Um, what can be done about this? Is this going to perpetuate lack of enforcement? Is it something that council needs to revisit in terms of contractual relationships with the scooter companies? Or, you know, what, what, what needs to be done to facilitate, to, to, you know, if we were talking about geofencing earlier, you know, maybe there are ways in which we could do this, but we were assured during uh, the debate on scooters that, that, you know, we would, this wouldn't be a problem, mm -hmm. that this would, in, in fact, be addressed by, I think, multiple departments, city legal, um, public works, you know, perhaps mm -hmm. it, could, it could be enforcement by, um, you know, neighborhood, uh, what's the term? Resource. Resource officers, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a variety of ways to address this. Um, so I guess my question is, can we have a commitment from your office that something will be done? You can't have a commitment that something will be done and things are currently uh, in the works, both from a, uh, a standpoint of uh, communications with the 
uh, the scooter companies as well as uh, public works creating a plan on fencing and corrals and uh, f uh, enforcement. So we've got a two-step uh, process that we're working on. We want to do it right. And we don't want to, uh, you know, this fits in with our whole idea of alternative transportation when done right. So um, I, Mr. Flair, our, our council member Flaherty rode one, uh, did, was it today you, were, you rode one? A few weeks ago, I've ridden one uh, uh, several times. Um, they make sense, but you're right. It has to be done right, and we have to put some teeth in it and, and let not only the riders know, but also the owners of the scooter companies who are making lots of money uh, that it must be done right if it's going to be done in Bloomington. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll wait uh, to see. So I appreciate your, your, your being committed to it. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from council? Okay, seeing none, we'll now go to public comment. Uh, Lowly. I thought he was already. I can wait till after public comment to ask a question. Well, you might as well go now. I thought we had three minutes per. Go ahead, go oh, ahead Council Member Vola. Uh, well, I mean, I, I only got the answer to my question after, during Council Member Rosenbarger's question. Uh, but I just wanted to ask uh, Ms. Kidd briefly to describe uh, the, the origin of the third cohort and to just talk about it a little bit because it's different than the first two cohorts. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it has some similarities with the first cohort, actually. So in the first cohort, we received an, uh, an in-kind grant from Bloomberg Philanthropies in order to further explore a topic of our choosing. And at that time, we looked at leaf management. And um, because the funding was granted or the, the in-kind grant started in February of 2020. It was uh, pretty soon after our initial boot camp that Bloomberg said, our program that we're supplying to you was structured to be fully in person. And we're not sure that we can um, complete our support to you as we initially had planned for. I have a background in process improvement and human-centered design. And so I completed the training of the initial cohort. Bloomberg um, this last year came back around and said, we'd like to open up the application process again to offer cities and we've got a different way of doing it. This is uh, much more hybrid, mostly virtual. And I asked if we could apply again because we weren't able to, or they weren't able to conduct their full training with us and they said, you're, you're free to apply, and they put us at the, the front of the list. And so this year we're receiving um, weekly coaching sessions that are at least an hour and a half long from um, the coaches that are supplied by Bloomberg Philanthropies. We get access to all of their human-centered design videos that we catalog and we can reuse after this program. Um, we get copies of all of their slide decks. And the topic that we're exploring is the, the maintenance of sidewalks with a goal of every sidewalk always navigable by everyone all the time. And we're getting ready to go. So we've explored the, the problem. We've done some research. Um, we had a midpoint presentation. I believe Sue Scambellari was at the midpoint presentation. Um, we're now into prototyping, we've done some community engagement and um, President Sandberg was at one of our community engagement meetings. And we're going into prototyping where we will um, Our try. time is up, that, that, thank you. I, I get the idea and that's okay. uh, excellent <laughs> exegesis. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chair. You're welcome. Do we have any more comments from council? Okay, seeing now, we'll go to the public comment. Do we have anyone on? Uh, Zoom, Mr. Lucas. 
And I will remind folks that if you want to make a comment on Zoom, please use the raised hand function on Zoom. Um, if you're on a mobile device, you can reach us at star nine. And if none of those work, you can send a note to our meeting host via the chat function on Zoom. No hands going up okay. at the moment. Thank you, and seeing none, do we have anyone here in the in-person public who wishes to make a comment? Seeing none, we'll now go to council for final comments before seeking a due pass recommendation. Seeing none, council member Volan. Uh, I, I, the first time I really feel like I uh, am grokking the function of the innovation director and I wanna read the bullet point from their slides that uh, really made me take notice. Uh, lead innovation training cohort number three, consisting of representatives from five departments, working together on one cross-departmental project by quarter four that aligns with mayoral priorities, has high value to residents, and engages residents in the process. Uh, I know that it's been a struggle for uh, innovation to literally come to terms with what they're trying to do. And, and uh, so I feel like this paragraph sort of distills what I hope would come out of uh, this initial innovation to the mayor's budget, which was a director of innovation. Um, like this is the first time that I can remember seeing something that uh, coherently uh, and uh, concisely uh, summarized what the innovation director uh, does or should be doing. And so I'm, you know, very excited by this new project and the idea that they're now, that the new innovation is uh, trying different projects than uh, the initial one about uh, uh, leaf collection. Um, this at least now shows a pattern. We're trying to find uh, issues that don't fall into one department and uh, they don't neatly fall into one department and uh, find a way to improve them, which can only be done by making the departments work together. So I'm uh, very excited for the future of that initiative, uh, more so than I have been. And uh, I just want to, uh, to put a shot out there. And, um, uh, you know, there are many other issues, but with respect to this particular budget and this particular function in the budget, I just want to say a good job. Thank you. Thank you. We have any further final comments from council? Okay, so I do believe we're ready for due pass recommendation. Uh, will the chief deputy clerk please call the roll? Yes, council member Smith? Yes. Rosenberger? Volan? Yes. Sims? Yes. Scambellari? Yes. Sandberg? Pass. Rollo? Pass. And Flaherty? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That is 503. 503. And I do believe that completes our business for this evening. Um, I do want to thank the administrative staff and all the um, presentations we got this evening. Thanks to our staff um, and the clerk staff. And that's the end of our business. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you. See you tomorrow night.